did get everybody's feedback on the subcommittees. Appreciate that. Uh, I need a little, we need a little bit of time to look through it, uh, sort it out, make sure we have a lot of strength on every committee. Everybody kind of wants the same one or two committees, as you can imagine. So we're going to ask you to stretch a little bit, maybe participate in more than one. Can we turn off? Yeah, we're working on it. Geez, I thought you ordered that. <laughs> We're really setting the mood. Get everybody a good voiceover. Get a soft shoe out here. <laughs> We're going to try to get that done in the next couple of days before this week is over, uh, because I think that subcommittee role is going to be really important moving forward. Uh, we've got a lot of great presentations on the docket for today. Uh, we're not going to have enough time to go way in depth with each one of them today. So as you're going, please jot down some of your notes that you might have for some of these folks questions that you want to ask them later. Uh, this doesn't have to be the last time you hear from them. In fact, I suspect for most of them will be ongoing conversations that we can have at that subcommittee level as needed. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. 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 No, I, I think it's going to be a, a good morning. I think we're going to learn a lot. I, I would just reiterate what Dan said is just really try to look through the lens of what group you're going to be a part of and what are some of the key things that you're looking to learn or have questions about and help that guide you for as we uh, kind of get further into the process. So, and if you can't remember which groups you signed up for, you're kind of waiting to see which it is. Just assume you're on all of them. Write down notes and questions as we go. And to that point, it, there if you have one that's a priority one that you put number one, but you're interested in participating in more than one, you're certainly welcome to do that. So, and we'd encourage you to. Any questions, comments from the task force? If not, I think we'll open it up to public comment. If there's anybody that would like to address the group today uh, for three minutes or less on any of the items that are on the agenda today, feel free to come forward and so on. If not, let's jump into our first presentation. Mr. Crayer. Oh, we might just start dancing with this music coming <laughs> up. Um, we'll get started here. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Maher, our superintendent. He, they're also with us. And assistant superintendent, Doug Morrison. So they're here in case I screw up and have some things I can't answer for you. So they, they're the wisdom back there for us. So they're here for support. And we'll get started. So I'm here to talk about Hollywood Field and Central Services, and we're kind of a neighbor to you, so I'm going to go through the history of how we got to where we are, what we've done over the last 20 years, and then what's on the docket for those two facilities over the next five to ten years. So, let's get started here. So, Howard Wood, it's a multi-purpose facility for football, soccer, track and field, and band. So some of the major events, not only does it host all our varsity football games and for all our, our three high schools, soon to be fourth high school, um, we also host the President's Bowl, Dakota Bowl, soccer playoffs, festival of bands, Howard Wood Dakota Relays, Special Olympics, and uh, the strike state track meet two out of three years that rotates to uh, Rapid City. So. It's always busy. Um, it's significant. It's gotten significantly busier since the field turf was in. They use it virtually every night of the week for middle school, for various things throughout the throughout the year. Okay, Central Services. That's our building to the west here, just Jason. I always say I have VIP parking in my office. It's kind of VIP spot. So. Um, What's in that, what's housed in that facility is Child Nutrition Center. That was the original building out there. Uh, that, that served uh, as food service offices, prepares and delivers food for all our elementary. So 11 to 12,000 meals a day come out of that facility. And that gets distributed to all the elementary schools. It also is our food service warehouse and freezers. We're able to buy in bulk, get better pricing, and we store it in there and then distribute it and so forth. We do have um, we do have kitchens at the high schools and middle schools throughout the district, but that primarily serves you know any early childhood or elementary sites. Purchasing the purchasing department, the district's purchasing department, 
their offices are there. The warehouse and delivery services are based out of, out of there. Uh, the mail service, we have an in, internal school system mail service to all 40 facilities that we, we house and that gets distributed out of that um, facility. And district transportation is housed out of there. So all the bus coordination and those sort of, we, we contract with the buses, but it's all coordinated out of that facility. We also have early childhood services. Uh, their offices are housed out of there. We have the district screening and evaluation. Whoops. Yeah, I got that. Um, district uh, screening and evaluation center. So when uh, parents bring their children there, they get evaluated if they qualify for those services. And we also house a district birth to three offices there. There's about 25 staff members that um, in the early childhood section there. It also houses information technology services, all the IT offices, networking, uh, assessment offices, student records are there, reprographic center, that's all our copy centers, so all the buildings put their request into that facility and we distribute it through the, the purchasing warehouse distribution, whether it's mail or if there's a big bulk, it goes into the delivery services. And all our network services are there, all the servers, so all the, the whole district you know, website and stuff is distributed out of that facility. And then we have a um, computer repair uh, area there as well. So if something breaks down, it comes there and gets that repaired in-house. Then operational services over there, that's my department. All our offices are there. We have the mechanical and HVAC shops. Carpentry and grounds shops are housed out of there. They get distributed to the, all the buildings throughout the day, but they're housed there. All the equipment is there, um, so everything's moved out of that one. Electrical shops as well. Then we also house the district's uh, vehicles and equipment storage. So all the plow trucks and all those sanders, uh, sweepers, tractors, and those sort of things are housed there that aren't at the buildings. And then we also manage all the energy management systems. Every school is managed and scheduled and for energy management out of that facility as well. So that's what we currently do at those, those buildings. So um, I'm gonna take you back in time so you can kind of get a feel for how we've been a partner with the city and this convention and arena area throughout the years. So uh, hopefully you'll learn something or maybe you've already had this, I don't know. But uh, we're gonna try to see what we can do. But this is how it looked 25 years ago in 1994, this, uh, this aerial. Um, so, a lot has changed in 25 years, and we've been part of that change, and we'll kind of tell you what we've done and how we coordinated and what, what's happened throughout the years. There's been several task force like this over the period of time, so a lot of things happened, and the sequencing was kind of interesting as you, as you watch. So, we have this Sioux Falls uh, baseball stadium, we have the arena, that was constructed in 61. Uh, this, the district's uh, buildings and grounds, the original building was housed, I think the water department had it for a few years, that, that was uh, central services, there was actually a metal building on the back of that, that was built in the early 80s, before my time, so I'm not, not quite as old as I was. Um, so that was there, uh, then we had Harwood uh, Field Complex, as you can see, um, that was in 1965. A lot of the overflow parking kind of wrapped around into that sea area uh, during events in grass areas. And then in 1989, this, the district uh, built the central kitchen for this, uh, the use of house in that uh, building up on Western. They, they were up there and then they built this one. And uh, so we had that central distribution area. Then the city, the city had a park area down there. So in 1994, there was a, a kind of a committee like this established, and we worked with the city on, on when the convention center was talked about and thought through. These are kind of the bullets of uh, an agreement that we have with the city, that the city acquired Howard Wood Field land for the Western Avenue relocation. Uh, the city purchased uh, Central Services building and warehouse. 
also for that uh, Western Avenue relocation. That the metal part, the Western Avenue actually went through the metal warehouse portion. Um, the city deeded land in the district south of Central Kitchen for the construction of a new facility that you see today for the building services and warehouse. And then the city constructed, we have an agreement with the city to construct and maintain parking lots around Howard Wood Field for the convention center and state. Of that, um, 1,100 1, spaces are supposed to be dedicated to Howard Wood. Now that's not dedicated always. That's If everybody has an event going on, we need to have about 1,100 stalls that we, we do. There's a lot of sharing that goes on people. So we were just trying to protect our parking so if if there's a baseball there's only that's only happened about three times that that where we combed off some areas that we had to have some spots so it's all about sharing and being part of a community when we do that so um, with that that's that's in that agreement and then the city reimbursed the district for relocating uh, Howard Wood events in ticket booth area so you'll see some of that when they came through so with that we'll go to what happened and how the sequence, this is an aerial uh, in 1998, so we'll kind of walk through what what happened throughout that time period. So, so if you look at A, Western Avenue was relocated to this location, as you can see it went through that building. Um, Central Service Services building was constructed. Uh, we added on to the Central Kitchen and we have the warehouse and we also took that in as advantage to consolidate some of our programs like IT was in a renting a building downtown so we moved that out here um, we were in a lot of different places so we brought everything centrally and it was an opportunity for us so we always look at some of these things as opportunities you know how can we be more efficient how how can we you know make things better for the district okay then the convention center was built around 1996 uh, Howard Wood Field, we constructed the new ticket booths on the two corners. Um, the convention center kind of went right through the, the old ticket booth and the ring road. That was in 96. And then uh, Sheridan Hotel was constructed around 98. And then after that, there was kind of a study. I, it was interesting. I kind of tried to break these down I, when I was going through to prepare for this. I saw some meeting notes and stuff for some of those meetings. There was another committee we talked about because the district was looking at doing some improvements at Howard Wood again. And uh, I saw in the notes that the chair said that we could go ahead with that. So we kind of were putting things on hold and then we moved forward. So with that, right at the end 2000, the Canary Stadium was, uh, did some renovations. Howard Wood, the turf was uh, installed. And then in 90, in 2005, Howard Wood, this was the one that we got, that note I was just talked about in 2005 is we moved forward with uh, putting new restrooms out there. We gutted the old restrooms, made some of that into concession storage and put a new restroom facility on home and visitor side. And then uh, Central Kitchen in 2009, we, we added a, an addition on to give us more food capacity. We were adding class or elementaries, delivery points. We were running out of space for how to run trucks through. So we put on an addition in 2009 for additional food service production capacity and delivery capacity. Okay, then, uh, so then there was another task force. When we, when we talk about the event center, the study program, the district was at that time had a RFP out. We, we hired an architect to start looking at renovating Howard Wood Field. So we put all that on hold while that committee was working and wondering what was going to happen out here. And uh, so we put everything on hold and we started doing, exploring some things for that committee. We looked at potential plan to replace Howard Wood out on the northwest side of Sioux Falls. We also looked at potential plans to construct individual stadiums at each high school. Some of those weren't too feasible. I mean, it was really cramped and you might have been able to do it, but I don't think uh, it would work for parking and you know the, the logistics of everything. And then after 
the community discussion with that, and there were some pros and cons, and some groups came together and complained about certain things and, and whatnot, and I won't get into all that. Um, but it was determined Howard Wood was gonna stay at the current location, and then the city unanimously passed the event center vote. So then we moved forward. So how did that, how did we move forward? So over in between 2010 and 2017, so we looked at <clears throat> what happened out here from that point. So Howard Wood, we installed a video board and sound system out at, at Howard Wood, that's on the east side facing the prevention center. Uh, we started our grandstand renovation project, so we reconstructed the grandstands, both home and visitors. We replaced the press box, we replaced the lighting, and we did a track replacement project. So that was what was on hold while we were waiting for that discussion of the community of whether we're going to stay there or not. And we moved forward with that after the vote and after it was determined that uh, Howard was, was going to be there. Uh, the Premier Center was constructed through 14. And then there's, there's some agreements that we, we established through this process. The city actually built the 60 parking stall, 60 stall parking uh, lot on central services and we entered into an agreement that they could use that and our facility of central kitchen parking after five o'clock Monday through Friday and any time during the weekend. So we have an agreement with that. We uh, They built it they initially but we're taking over the maintenance of it. We'll, that'll be like our lot but it's the agreement is that it's a public parking spaces um, after five o'clock during the day. I mean, sometimes when you have the summit week and some of those, we struggle to, we don't get too upset, but they do come over and, and uh, there's a lot of times we have uh, stampede games and people have their VIP parking in our, our area. So so with that, that's, uh, that's part of the being a neighbor. And then uh, <coughs> then we did the Howard Wood field replacement, uh, the field turf in 2015. <coughs> I think one of the most noticeable things in uh, 2017, we uh, reconstructed the field house. So what's, what's the future hold and what are, what's our thoughts? Um, and what are, we, what are we planning on doing for those facilities in the next five to 10 years? Some of these are funded, some of these are not funded. So with that, the, the central services portions are part of that bond that was passed, the $190 million bond that was included in that. So that's what this is. Um, we, we want to build a security lobby, training room, and what basically it's some dominoes that will happen that early childhood, they're really shoehorned in with those people. And we're, we're trying to put this in so that it gives them the room that's in the training areas now for the proper offices. And then uh, look at reconfiguring the uh, vehicle storage area for purchasing warehouse modifications to make that a little more efficient throughout. And with that, that part of that's gonna require the addition of vehicle storage and equipment addition that will also be, because they're gonna take up some of that vehicle storage now. So there's some dominoes that exist in, in this plan. But those are the three, three items that were, have been identified for this facility um, probably in the next four years. We, we put these on, there's a five year plan, we put these on the end of it, so if there's any issues with budgets during that, that this would be the, the last to get done. We, we always kind of try to strive for the students first and support later. Okay, then Howard Wood Field. Um, these projects were identified in the, with our task force and, the, and uh, they were not carried forward to the funding portion. So these will have to be funded after that bonding thing is done or if our preventive maintenance portion. So they kind of both fall into both categories. But um, we're looking at uh, replacing the concession buildings at, on the home side. Try to make it a little more efficient, make where you can come and support. Right now, everybody backs up into the circulation spline. If you could, if you had more room, that would be great, you know, to push it out. But uh, this this takes into account that our footprint is stagnant. When we did this one. So the 
we not, we're not growing our footprint to, based on these things. Then a, a visitor's concession building, replace that. That would be a phase, a different phase. And then looking also to add additional restrooms. Now, if, if you notice the wall that's built there, that wall is designed for that future restroom. It's, the size of it is for that future restroom. So it'd be another restroom just like what's there on the east side would be there. And this would not even get us to the current code level by adding this restroom. What we do now is bring porta potties in for the big events. You know, most of our events don't require that level, but there's a few that do. So this would get us uh, pretty close on the home side to that. So those are some of them. Then uh, looking at grants, grandstand fencing replacement, uh, kind of uh, make that a little nicer fencing. Some of that's getting old. Uh, the bob wire, we still have bob wire out there, which is amazing. But um, update that, and then some of the fencing around the other side. That's a few years out yet, but uh, that's the long-term maintenance plan. <coughs> that age of those fencing are starting to rest and um, get a little warm. So that is the extent of what the planning out there is. So with that, if there's any questions um, concerning our buildings and how we've done, we try to be a partner with the city on every aspect as we develop this area, and we will continue to do that. So I always look at everything as opportunities. So with that, we got That's a question for you, Jeff. So the current location of central services offices, you talk a little bit about what, what makes that an ideal location for the district and has there been any discussion through the years about a different location for that? Um, it meets our needs. It's a good central location. You can get to everywhere in the city. Are there, better, are there other areas? There probably are that could get you just as much. It is a little landlocked. There's no question about that as far as what's available around there. But it does meet our needs right at the current, current time. We have not had any discussion about relocating it. Um, now we, we were asked at one time when they were doing the convention center if we wanted to relocate. So. Is there a, to follow up on his question, it, there were, it looked like three and a half million dollars or so worth of future planned work there. Is there, yes. a, is there a timeline attached to spending that money? I mean, it's it, about four years. Four years. Yeah, we'll probably start the design. I've got some preliminary layouts, so we have a pretty good idea of what it is. But that's about four years in that sequential of when the projects are going to start getting. So it kind of follows the same pattern of what some of these other ones are. If there's some dynamics that happen that we would certainly look at how that would work and I think Dr. Maher might be able to say anything with that but uh, I always say is there's an opportunity and yeah I mean I think you know we've shown in the past that we're willing to look at things if, they, if the community is saying something um, with certain certain things like in the, in the past when we moved our warehouse and that you know we were the city made us whole and we were able to accomplish and make things better so and, and there's a building that's immediately north to you that the city owns yeah, yeah. the former water utility building yeah. that was our office at one time it was okay yeah. thanks so just following up on that it's that with the perpetual growth of the school district um, in the 20-year plan and growth is that you're saying that's a part of that maybe master plan or are there other ideas for will you need additional spaces 20 years out from now and with the growth that, and all of the facilities you continue to add? Well, it really depends on if the density of Sioux Falls increases. If the density continues to increase, then our district will grow. So we're going to be at the end of our boundaries within the next 10 years, 15 years, and our growth won't be as great as it has been unless the density changes in that certainly seems to be the case at times, you know, what that is. So right now we're not projecting the need for that. Um, but um, you never know. We, we project every year of what's happening and, and do a, a new projection. So, Jeff, has there been any study or any uh, uh, looking at all in terms of Howard Wood 
and its longevity. Uh, any projections of whether that's another 10-year facility or 25-year facility or 50-year facility? Do we know any of any of those details? Um, I think you're seeing that it's a good 20 to 30, probably 30 plus years. We just just <coughs> completed the field house. That's a 60-year, 60, 60 to 100-year um, solution. Um, the track is there. That's on a 15-year cycle. The, um, the field is always on about a 10 to 15-year cycle, depending on the wear. And our goal is to use it, wear it out. Um, so that facility is being used but we we just redid the grandstand so that's another probably 30 to 40 year cycle so that facility other than the concession areas are pretty you know kind of old or kind of you know worn um that facility is in pretty good shape long term no knowing you're not leaving howard wood is there a secondary field in the future for all of the needs and obviously more schools and needs growing or no nice? but Okay. Right now, the, the, hop, the we set up the high schools for the junior varsity, those events. They can also house, if, if things happen, they can schedule middle school things at different locations. Middle school also has fields themselves. So if we had to, you could go into some lighting to give you more options at the, sure. at the main high schools sure. and accommodate more there. But we have, you know, you gotta remember that Augustana, University of Sioux Falls, those are all used to house out of there. So we do have some slots and I think ability to be able to accomplish our high school varsity games at that, that facility. So, so yeah, I think um, we should be okay. I don't think we see it another high school after this new one comes. <laughs> How about parking for your large scale events like the President's Bowl? Uh, I know you mentioned there's sometimes issues with blocking off your 1100 spots, but generally speaking for those large scale events, are you, is the school district satisfied with the parking situation generally? It's, it's worked, it's worked well. Um, I mean, we try to coordinate and find out when those events are with the, the event center, the convention center, and kind of try to anticipate what those are. Um, we have, we have a handful of them that we have to watch watch for. And we also can do the busing if we had to, if it became, came to that. But some of those events, track meets, they come and go so much. Um, it's a team busing, so you have team busing areas so that the, the teams can get to the buses if the weather is, you know, there's bad weather and stuff. So we, it hasn't been a, a big issue. There's been a couple times where Canaries, then you had that garden show here, that, that put, put some strain on parking and put some strain on the neighborhood. Jeff, what about usage of Howard Wood? Is it exclusively for high schools, or could you have a professional soccer team play there, or could you have minor league football playing there? What about usage for Howard Wood? All of the above. Um, there, there is ability for people to rent it. We, we had an SDSU game a few years ago there. Uh, just a matter of first take care of the district and then what's available and there's rental rates that are pretty favorable that would allow some of that to happen as long as it could fit in everybody's schedule i mean the, the real goal is for us to use that facility that's what it's there for and the more we use it the more viable it is but yeah i mean it's uh we used to be the the home field for augie sioux falls university of sioux falls and uh, so yeah, I'm thinking there's op options for that. It's not during you know certain times. It's not used that much. I mean, you look at it during the day. Um, there's there's opportunities there to use, and we do have a rental structure set up for that. Jeff, do you have a sense for how many event days there are in a typical calendar year, and what times of year your kind of your peak usage? Well, uh, fall, I don't have about that one ahead, but the, the fall with football and soccer and those sort of things, and then people trying to practice, bands and trying to practice. And, I, and if you get a wet fall, it's even more so because the, the fields at the schools become brutal and muddy and a mess. So the bands are all trying to get out here to, to be on a field. So 
the fall is probably the <coughs> most, and then they're getting ready for festival bands and those sort of things. And uh, so it varies. And then the track season, winter they're just not going to <coughs> Um, but the track and the middle school tracks and those sort of things and there's conference track meets and so forth throughout there. So it's it's utilized pretty much every day um, throughout the spring and fall. Summer's a little little low. I mean the bands will come out and practice. I mean the bands you got you gotta go back. The band actually work harder than the football team sometimes. They they're they're <coughs> six in the morning to Whenever I just it just amazes me. What what events and activities does the school district use the event center or Canaries Field or any of those? State I tournaments don't, outside the state tournament. I'm guessing the the event center if they do the state when we host the state state meets, you know state basketball or state volleyball, we work with them and coordinate that. Our director of athletics um, coordinates all that and works with them. Canaries, I've not seen really anything there. So that's, that's I, I've not seen one of them. Okay. You know, unless we have a Canaries night or something <coughs> with the district. So, mm -hmm. so um, this comes from a, a mother's perspective. So my, my son was a football player for Washington High School. And um, coming out here during the games when there was a lot of stuff happening, um, parking was absolutely a nightmare. <laughs> Especially when I was late. So um, I'm just wondering, you had mentioned something about the busing. You could you could do busing, and I was, I, I guess I don't know what what are the thoughts on that. Well, when this, I was referencing a little bit that if it ever came to that kind of work with the city, because they a lot of times will set up. You know, Southeast Tech, you know, different, um, the county, the, the fairgrounds, sure. and have busing, shuttle buses that will bring people in when they have big events. So if there is such a, a big event that's going to happen, <coughs> we dual, then we would have to work on maybe doing something like that. Because if I remember correctly, there, there was at least a time or two um, when a football game was canceled because there was parking issues. Um, is that now something that they that you implement would be the busing idea? Um, we have not. We personally haven't done the busing, but okay. you know when when we're coordinating our events with the event center and the you know and the convention center, you know and that's going to get busier. So yeah. we have to think through those things because the utilization of this building and and you just see more and more. I, I sit out there and <laughs> see that and. You can see it's getting busier and busier from the time it's open um, to what it is today. Jeff, if you were to put a price on moving Howard Wood Field as it sits today, what kind of money would you be talking about? I'd have to do a little study, but I think it was when we did this event center, it was in the 31 to 34 million dollar range um, when we did that study. Yeah. Back. You know, 10 years ago. I still have the drawings of that, but I think some of the biggest things was um, there was a vision of that facility not host being a multi-purpose facility. And I think that's what some of the, the drawbacks were to that plan because the track moved out to its own. And then you had a state track meet with that has 15,000 people and there's no seating for them. So that's where some of that pushback came. Um, I think if you add up what we've done out there, it's almost $12 million, a little over $12 million, so, you know, since 2010. Hey, Jeff, one more question on central services. What's the approximate size of the footprint that that sits on, and then and then the buildings, just from, just from a um, school? The building's about, oh, about 98,000 square feet. And then the whole, like, how many is that an acre or is that? Oh, uh, no, it's probably three and a half, four acres. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Jeff? Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate the time. Good luck with your 
Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Anybody? Right. Main school may be in the general manager role of the Canaries Baseball Club. Um, the school history and myself, I, I started as an intern with the Canaries in 2013. Um, went to stadium operations, assistant general manager, and then general manager. This is my, my fourth season, so 2015 was my, my first year. Um, just a little background on our, on our club and our organization. Um, we've been in Sioux Falls for, um, I guess, for the two current leagues we've been in, which was the Northern League and the American Association now since 1993. So we've been a part of Sioux Falls for 27 years. Um, we do have an ownership group that is, is based out of Stillwater. They're, they have a background in sports. Um, Tom Garrity, one of our minority owners, is the commissioner for the uh, USHL Stampede Hockey Club. Um, so he, he oversees the entire league, as well as Mark Ogren, our, our majority owner, um, has a petroleum-based uh, business in, in Stillwater, Minnesota. Has previously owned some Northwoods League teams, owns a professional soccer club over in Scotland, and just has a big, big background in sports, and it's, it's a major passion for him. So, um, and again, they're based out of Stillwater, Minnesota. So, um, the point of this, I was hoping to just maybe open it up to some Q and A. I'll give you a little bit more background on, on some events and, and the ballpark with, with some of our goals, um, some potential needs that we have, and, and some a few projects that we have currently going on right now. Um, so really, this kind of a league background, uh, the American Association has been around uh, for about 15 years now. We have 12 clubs all the way from Winnipeg, Canada, Kansas City, uh, Florida, Chicago, all the way down to, to Cleburne and Grand Prairie, Texas. So we are basically all over throughout the Midwest. Um, there's a handful of independent <coughs> ball clubs, or, or ball leagues within the, uh, the United States. The American Association is definitely one of the more stable ones. There's a lot that pop up um, each and every year, but the American Association is, is very consistent, has, has wonderful ownership backing, and just continues to grow. This year we're adding a new ball club in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, they're in the process of building a new ballpark right now, about a 60, $65 million uh, uh, stadium, which, which will hold about 6,500 people. Last year we added a new club um, in Chicago, Chicago Dogs. We built an $85 million stadium in, in the suburb of, of uh, Rosemount, and it's a beautiful facility. St. Paul Saints are, are probably the most, um, most well-known club within, within, our, within, our, within our league, and they, they do a, a ton of various promotions that they get in the ballpark downtown. Uh, it's about four years old. CHS Field is absolutely beautiful. So we, we are a, a league that, that is continuing to grow, adding more clubs as, as we kind of go, and um, the level of play has continued to rise as well. Um, as far as events and stuff that we host, obviously the American Association schedule is 100 games, uh, 50 which are home, 50 which are on the road. Um, so between those, you know, within the long months of, of March and October, we try to host as many non-baseball events as well as other baseball events throughout the year as well. Um, in total, we're, we're somewhere between 60 and 80 events throughout the year, whether it be high school state tournaments, region tournaments. Um, in the past, we posted the Nitro Circus, which is a big motocross, uh, big motocross stunt show. Um, we, we posted uh, a few smaller concerts and, and various events like that. This year, we have a big high school tournament coming up here in uh, towards the end of May. And then in the middle of August, we have a, 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 a very big national Legion tournament comes to park as well. Um, that, that's going to feature teams from kind of all over the Midwest, whether it be Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, North and South Dakota, and, and it, it, it's going to be kind of a qualifier for, for the national tournament. So that, it's a new one this year for us, and it's going to be going to be very very big and, and a great uh, a great thing for not only the stadium but for the city as well, bringing a lot of a lot of a lot of families and you know additional revenue there as well. So. Um, as far as our facility goals, obviously the Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls Stadium is, I think it was built in 1964. Um, as Jeff kind of touched on the last significant upgrade, it was in 1999 and 2000 when we added our suite level. We got nine suites as well as our press box. Um, I believe they also did our, our home clubhouse as well, um, which have all held up really well. There's been a few repairs that have been needed along the way as far as the HVAC system. Um, but over the last number of years, it's, it's Upgraded and it's been it's been great. So you know, the ballpark's been 
perfect for what we've needed it for. Um, but obviously our goals are to provide obviously exceptional you know, experience for our fans through you know, great, great concessions, great food. Um, minor league baseball is all about the additional promotions that we're kind of running, um, giveaways, and, and overall entertainment on the field and doing things. Um, you know, so a lot of people <coughs> on the park are, are just there for, for the baseball, they're there for the, the social aspect, for the company outing, just to have a good time. So within our party decks, our suite levels, and, and our stands, I, I believe that we provide a, a pretty, good, uh, pretty good experience for everybody that shows up. Um, obviously, we want to continue to be a great, great part of the company and the SMG and the complex. Um, you know, with, with with all these additional events, our, our goal ultimately is to add as many non-baseball events as we can. Like I touched on, natural circus um, concerts are something that we've kind of tossed around the idea of potentially doing. It's not necessarily within our, our ballpark, for lack of a better term. Um, but, but those are certainly things that we're we're open to and, and would love to utilize the surface as, as much as we possibly can. Um, as far as needs, you know, just kind of a, a brief history going back a little bit. The, the last number of years, far before my time, um, the, the Sioux Falls Canaries have been <coughs> the sole tenant of the, of the bird cage. Um, any additional events are, are really on us to bring in. The city has provided a few for us as well, and, and, and they handle kind of the logistics there. But, um, you know, we, we are... Uh, Know, there's a few difficulties that I guess come with, with all these additional events. One, our staffing isn't necessarily huge, so anything outside of the baseball norm is, is, is new to us and, and foreign, so we, we rely on a few other partners that, that can help us with that. But, um, you know, as far as, as far as needs, when we have large groups like Nitro Circus, I'll go back to a few times, for example, we had about 10,000 people there. Um, <coughs> the stadium really isn't quite set up for a, 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 a number of that size with our, our restrooms, our, our concessions. Um, just some of the concession equipment is getting a little bit older. Um, some of the windows need to be replaced, and, and uh, you know, just it, it was it was kind of new to us. Um, but, but overall, it went out, went on without many hiccups, and I think it was pretty successful. But um, jumping into the needs as well. Um, SMG's been a, been a great partner with us for over the last two years and helped us with, with some, some, some different renovations and upgrades with, with the party deck decking, um, some of our plumbing system, our, our HVAC system, which have, have slowly been upgraded, and then uh, you know, some, some dish, additional repairs throughout the concourse with, with some, some structural repairs that need to be done with, with the columns, as well as uh, you know, some concourse work and concrete work. So that's been, that's been a wonderful partnership. But, um, we do have a few difficulties in, in comparison to some of the clubs in the leagues. Our visitor clubhouse is, is definitely a little bit dated. Um, we have 25 to 28 grown men in there. It, it, it is it's pretty tight. Um, you know, we obviously do the best we can, but it is one of the, the lower ends in the league. Um, our dugouts are definitely in need of, of a little bit of a, a bump. Um, there's we, we always have a few issues with flooding. Um, just the drainage itself is, is, is dated and needs some updating. Um, there have been a few times where throughout the games, we've, if we've had a lot of rain throughout the week, we've, we get water that keeps keeps coming into the ballpark or into the dugouts. And we got to just keep going and kind of pump them out as best we can. So there, there are some definite challenges when it comes to an older stadium like that. Um, our scoreboard and video board, as well as the equipment that kind of goes along with it, is something that we would like to like to upgrade here um, within the next number of years. And I believe that was another addition in 1999 or 2000. Um, and it's, it's definitely, uh, it serves its purpose, it does as well, but it's something that we would like to, like to get upgraded here within the, uh, the, the next handful of years. Um, a few other challenges that we might face there as far as our office area, which is kind of connected to our merchandise stand. The merchandise area is a little bit small. Um, We'd like to expand that by about double right now, probably 200 square feet. We'd like to, to get around the four or 500, but it's not a huge priority, but it's something that we, we would definitely like to like to see. Um, I touched on some of the concourse repairs with you know, replacing cracked concrete and, and uh, some columns that are that are, are sort of show a little bit of wear. Um, but but again, SMG has been a, a wonderful partner in that and getting some of those some of those repair. Um, touching on, on some of the parking, obviously. Um, you know, we've, 
for, for our needs when we got kind of a standalone event, the parking is more than adequate. Um, there, there's been a handful of times that, you know, obviously SMG has a, a premier center has a has a concert going on, or, or Hollywood has a few different events um, where there are some, some conflicts, but, but overall, um, as Jeff touched on, there's maybe two or three throughout the year that, that really uh, affect our, our walk of attendance or anything. So overall, parking has been uh, more than more than fine for us. Um, I guess that, that's kind of a, a little bit of a background on our end. Um, I'll open it up to any questions on, on maybe the, the baseball operations, the facility itself, or anything else about it. Talk, talk to me a little bit about attendance on these 50 home games. Yeah, so attendance last year was, we saw overall revenue numbers um, being the best they've been in, in 10 years last year. Our attendance rose by, by 11,000. Um, over the last five years, we've averaged about 126,000 um, throughout the 50 events. And the way we base our, our attendance numbers is basically on, on tickets purchased. So, Say on a, a, a random Tuesday night, we have 2,000 tickets purchased. Uh, sometimes only 1,200 people show up, but, but those are the amount of tickets that are purchased, and that's kind of the number that, that we go with. Um, we have, last year we had five sellouts. Um, most of them are Friday nights, and we have our fireworks and, and, and some bigger promotions. Um, but our attendance has it, it, it's gotten better. Last year was, was it's obviously not where we want it to be, but with, with various promotions, we found some things that have worked, some things that maybe haven't worked, and we're tailoring our, tailoring our, our promotional marketing kind of around the things that have worked, obviously. So. How does that compare to the other cities in your association, or other cities our size? Yeah, so it, it's hard based on the <coughs> cities that are, are our size. I guess the most comparable would be either Fargo or, or maybe Sioux City. Sioux City averages probably 1,000 people a game, maybe 1,200. Um, Fargo does a really nice job. They got a, a huge season ticket holder base, third in the three thousands. Um, but Sioux Falls is definitely one of the smaller markets within our division um, or within our league. Um, obviously, with the likes of St. Paul, Kansas City, Chicago's, they got millions of people to draw from. We're, we're, we don't have quite that many. Um, so overall, percentage per capita, we're, we're right, right in comparison with all the other big, big markets, if not a little bit better. Uh, I don't know if you can share this, but are the canaries profitable? Um, I won't dive into details a whole lot. It's, it's, we've gotten much, much better. Um, is it profitable? No, um, but it's very, very close. And we think with, with their ownerships, obviously, the experience in, in what we in the sports world and baseball world, we're, we're trending in, in the right direction. We're, we're very, very close. I think this year, if not next year, we're going to be where we need to be. Obviously, the, the ownership doesn't do it to, to turn a huge profit. You know, they do it because they obviously love the community. They love sports. It's a passion of theirs, and that's why they, they're involved in it. Um, I was looking here. It looks like this, it's in the city's best interest when you sell a lot of tickets because over 150,000 tickets and 160,000 tickets, the city gets $2 per ticket, and above 60,000 tickets, they get $3 per ticket. Yes. Unfortunately, 2013 was the only year you were at 160, mm -hmm. and you haven't been at 150 since 2008 otherwise. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to get ticket sales up? <coughs> yeah, and that's one thing I think this year we're hoping, with, with last year's trend, <coughs> we're going to trend up. Um, unfortunately, with our business, a lot of it is based on weather. If it's raining, you know, obviously people simply choose not to, not to come for a little bit less, less of a, a, a fun experience. Um, last year we had, had pretty good weather. We had a few days affected by, by rain. Um, but that's one difficulty and one thing that's completely out of our control. So there's, there's been a couple of years, I think in 2017, when our attendance went down a little bit. I think we had eight games that were affected by weather. Um, one thing this year that's, that's really encouraging is our season kicks off May 16th. And we're actually down in Texas for a week and then we we'll go to Chicago for a week. So we don't open up until May 31st this year, which previously, when season kicks off May 16th, we've been home. We've been home for 10 days. And it's always kind of a coin flip what happens there. For example, last year we had a great opening night, it was beautiful, and the rest of the, the, the next, the rest of the home center, I think seven games, it was in the 50s, and it was just, it was not baseball weather. 
Um, so we're hoping this year with our, our little adjusted schedule and start on the road, it's going to make a significant di difference in our, uh, in our attendance. Do you, have to, do you have the ability to influence that schedule so that your home starter is later in May? Yes, and that's one thing actually our ownership made a big push for this year. Um, a lot of the northern teams, Winnipeg, Fargo, they always start down south. Um, obviously, the, uh, North Dakota has, uh, or Fargo has, University of North Dakota uses their field um, for all their events. Um, we have University of Sioux Falls that uses ours as their own ballpark. So we kind of use that as, as a as some leverage to, to start down south. Um, their schedule the past 10 years has really been similar to what ours has been. And um, so again, our ownership group made a big push to start down south and, and, and help us out a little bit. And, and this is the first year they've kind of granted that. We're hoping, hoping it'll be the same over the next number of years. So. Okay, um, I do have a series of questions sure. actually. So um, you were talking about some compar some comparison cities like mm -hmm. Fargo and Sioux City. Yep. Where are their facilities in comparison or in connection with their downtown or other larger areas of mm -hmm. commerce? Sure. Sioux City is 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 kind of off the beaten path a little bit. Um, it's kind of right. It's right on the highway. But it is, it's nowhere near downtown. Um, it's, it's not difficult to get to, but it's definitely out of the way. Fargo's is is pretty similar to that. It is it's north of the city a little bit, but it's right on um, the college campus, and it's, it's very easy to get to. Um, but facility-wise, they're they're quite they're quite comparable. Fargo has um, both Fargo and Sioux City have a have, have a brand new a, a brand new uh, video board. Um, they've made some some upgrades within the last number of years to their, their baseball operations side or their clubhouses and, and dugouts um, and that kind of thing. So fairly comparable. Fargo is, is definitely a little bit more uh, more ideal than Sioux City, but <coughs> comparable. Is there anything that Sioux City is connected to? No. No? Okay. Pretty similar. When your population comes in for games, mm -hmm. is are they staying for a long period of time? <coughs> Does your event drive them to want to do more in our city? I believe so. I mean, we haven't done a whole lot of, uh, I guess, research on that end. Um, that is one thing we want to do some, some more surveys this year to kind of figure out exactly what our fan base likes, where they're coming from. I know a lot of our groups come from not only Sioux Falls, obviously, but the surrounding communities. Um, we've had some come from, obviously, Western South Dakota, from the Twin Cities, even um, North Dakota and Iowa. And, a lot of those times, I know they're, they're, they're staying in the shared and they're staying in the Grand Coda and a few other places in the area. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about other events that happen at um, your facility. When going around the nation, sure. starting to um, just research and building larger um, sporting events, yep. and part of it is all customer experience all of the experience of the fan and being connected more with a bigger experience for our city. Um, when you tour throughout your week, what are what are some things that stick out to you that drive more success for the other players in the league? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So a lot of them, and it, each city and each ball of kind of has their own niche. <coughs> St. Paul, which is uh, they're one of the most uh, highly attended minor league facilities in, in the nation. Um, they're they're passing about 8,500. They draw about 9,000 a night. Um, they're a little bit different where they do a, a bunch of very random, sporadic kind of promotions. Um, you know, they do one where it's a, a cat day. Where there was prior to the game, they, they show an hour of just cat fun cat videos and stuff like that. It's just a huge driver for them. They'll hold 14,000 people at those kind of rooms. Um, we've tried to kind of spread some of the some of the promotions. I mean, Star Wars is a big one for them as well. They're, they'll bring in some acts. We've done that before, and it, it hasn't dri driven the needle a whole lot. Um, but with them, they get such a different niche that people just kind of come to come expect it with us. Or, I'm sorry, with them. We've we've discovered that Sioux Falls fan base is a lot more 
old school, a lot more uh, traditional, where we've, we've done the random promotions throughout every inning throughout different games, and it's just not, not something that people are necessarily attracted to. A lot of people, at least our, our, our main fan base, is, is the traditional way of control and, and, and look at the green grass and can watch the game. And, and uh, um, so, yeah. yes, we, we haven't quite discovered exactly what what it is that, that they do that we can kind of do. There's There's been a few things that we've kind of plucked that have, have worked well and some have happened. So. so talking about those feeder clubs, mm -hmm. you have SEBA, you have the new minor league, yep. Sioux Falls. So yep. Um, what are your relationships with them, and do you usually see them coming to your games as well? We do, and uh, obviously Sioux Falls is a very proactive community with SEBA. There's always something going on, it seems like, with <coughs> excuse me, SEBA um, obviously is a, a, a big partner of ours. Um, we work with them, offer a bunch of different ticket specials um, throughout the summer until about early July. They have so many games going on that we don't see a lot of their parents, their, their kids coming out to games. Um, but once that ends, we, we run very big promotions, we sponsor some of their big tournaments, and those visiting teams that are coming into Sioux Falls, we see a lot of those coming to our games with our, our different promotions and stuff that we're running on and taking specials for them. So overall, it's, it's been a, a, a really great relationship with Siva. So I've talked to some of those old school fans and they've <laughs> certainly got an emotional connection to Sioux Falls Stadium. And I think that's very much so unique to the baseball world and the baseball culture. At the same time, the club obviously needs, you know, whether it's a new facility or upgrades and they need, you know, new, new things to keep fans excited and going. Is there a position that the club has on that? Are they emotionally tied to Sioux Falls Stadium or? <laughs> yes and no. Obviously we, we love our facility. Sioux Falls Stadium is nothing but, but exceptional for us. Um, that being said, there are some difficulties. Um, those, fan, those fans that you talk about that are traditionalists, um, they show up and want the team to win. Um, over the last number of years, it's been a little bit, we haven't been where we wanted on the wins and losses side. And a lot of that is attributed <coughs> to the facilities. Um, you know, our batting cage area isn't, isn't, isn't great, our, our, our dugouts aren't great, our visiting clubhouse is not, our home clubhouse is awesome. Um, but when trying to recruit some of these players when we're going up against the Kansas Cities, the St. Pauls, um, the Chicago's, the Milwaukee's that have the brand new, brand new um, stadiums, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a little bit more difficult. Um, but, but those fans, I think, are, are certainly, they like Sioux Falls Stadium. It's definitely got its little quirks and subtleties that um, make it a lot more, a lot more intimate. Per se, where you're, you're kind of right on the action, where some of these bigger facilities are, um, you're a lot more distant, and you don't necessarily have that, that player interaction. That's one thing that we really kind of preach to our, to our players is being involved in the fan base, making sure that although baseballs are five dollars a piece, I don't necessarily like it so much that you know players are handing hand baseballs to guys and are taking, taking time to sign autographs and making sure that those kids have a good experience. So, um, Sioux Falls Stadium is great with with with, with with those aspects for sure, but it definitely has its has its challenges. So, this is just like a, a curious question because you sort of started on it before. Sure. But the some information that we were provided um, suggests that a newer facility maybe would result in higher attendance. Okay, right, fair enough. Sure. Um, but there's also data that suggests that you've got some newer stadiums out there where they, they still have low attendance. And so if I was going to walk through the stadiums that you play in and how the attendance correlates to that, it's, is it maybe more location driven than whether or not it's new? Because if I go down a list that I'm looking at, this is page 70 of the campus study group deal is, you've got St. Paul Saints Stadium, which has an impressive 116% capacity for attendance. I didn't know that was possible. Um, <laughs> But it's downtown St. Paul. Yep. You, you got Fargo, close to downtown. You got Lincoln, the Haymarket, um, Kansas City, Gary. I mean, you go down the list, but then you've got a few that are newer that just have relatively poor attendance. And so I, I think there's a pattern spotted there, but I'd be curious if you would maybe just expand on that a little bit and from what you've seen traveling to those other markets. Yeah, I, mean, I think 
the newer stadiums that we might touch on that are, are the Texas teams, um, they are, they're a little bit, they're, they're different than most a lot of clubs. Their, their ownership group um, doesn't necessarily, they're not baseball people, um, so they don't put a lot of emphasis into the promotions and, and the random, um, the random things that draw people into the stadium. Obviously, in, in the Texas areas, um, it's very hot, and a lot of the fans just don't simply show up for, for those games. I guess I, I'm not able to touch on, and I, maybe it's due to not necessarily knowing, but why they don't draw. Um, Where are they located? One is Cleburne, Texas, which is just west of, west of Dallas. A but close while. to the, the a downtown or another commercial area, or is it kind of out on its own? It, it's kind of out on its own. Okay. Yeah, you know, Cleburne's Cleburne. Um, they're a newer, they're a newer, newer city. I think they're three years old. A new franchise, um, and it's just they, they've done some kind of weird things. For example, um, the Grand Prairie, Texas, which is under the same ownership group, which is is right outside of Dallas as well. They basically partnered with a, with a Chinese team that provided all their players for them, and they were. You know, on the 100 games, I think they were 20 and 80. You know, so their their quality of baseball is really substandard with the league. Um, and the league potentially is looking at just removing Texas from the league and, and kind of creating their own league out there, just because it's so far off the beaten, beaten path for for all of teams up in the north and, and in the Midwest here. So, what it is that they do that that doesn't draw the fans, I guess I'm not 100% sure, but I know they obviously have, are in a bigger market and, and within the 30, 40 mile radius, they have a significant amount of people. So if I'm hearing you correctly, um, it's not necessarily so much that the park is downtown, it's that, because from what it sounds like, most of these are off the beaten path, but it's the, um, the experience. Sure. It's the niche that the ballpark has found that feeds into the community that pulls them out. And then also the facility itself being a nicer. More of the video, absolutely. Yeah, there, there are some teams. Uh, uh, obviously, St. Paul is one that is, is kind of the gold standard within our league, CHS field. This was touched on the draw 116% capacity every night. Um, I should say on average. Their ball, I'm sorry. It's right downtown. Yeah. And they, there was, a, I know they went through, had to jump through a lot of hoops to get it downtown. Um, the argument was there's no room, there's no parking. Um, that's one stadium I've been to quite a few times. And most of the people that are there, because there, there really isn't parking around there, but obviously in the summertime, they're, they're more than willing to park a half mile away, a mile away. And just the surrounding areas of bars and restaurants has flourished with, with all the parking. So, so for us, you know, whether it's a new ballpark, whether it's upgrades there, whether it stays the same, um, it's not huge. I don't think it'll be a huge uh, issue for us either way. Um, but I do think that there would be some some additional revenue that would be generated if it, if it happened to go downtown or if it went you know, by the Pentagon or something like that. Um, but it, uh, St. Paul, for example, it, it, you know, has definitely flourished from, from it being downtown. Is there a possibility that you could put together just a matrix of all of the different teams in your league and relate it to the walkability to other businesses or customer experiences? Yeah. Yeah. And make um, what would be really beneficial to me is just if you gave each customer experience a point of one in a walkability to a parking lot or to a bus station, uh, how that actually correlates. Because when I go traveling, I love going to baseball games, and the best baseball games are when I can walk to them. Right. Because then I know I'm not driving home. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's really could you do that yeah. for our team? Mm -hmm. That'd be really helpful. Yeah, do. Are there any provided ticket sales information that shows, like, do, you have, do you have to pay any royalties to the league? Do they track your attendance? Do they? They'll track attendance to a certain extent. They, there's no royalties paid to them based on on, uh, on tickets sold. With the league being a part of the league, there's there's league dues that obviously come out every year. That 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 is, is their source of revenue. Um, there are some royalty from jerseys and hats that, that come from the club, but as far as ticket sales, no. 
I'd like to understand a little bit more kind of the outside events, and I think maybe this answer needs to partly come from Scott and, and Mike a little bit on, you talked about these non-baseball events being a priority for you, mm -hmm. but also how taxing those one-off events sure. and the out-of-the-box things are for your team. Uh, can you help me understand from a contract perspective uh, why they are running outside events, different events other than baseball at the stadium, rather than somebody like Mike, whose team has a lot of experience with all the different variables from a wide range of events? Well, I mean, you know, we, we do have the ability to, to book some things over there. We've done some, I think, some pre-parties and stuff like that. And again, me being fairly new, I'm coming, coming into this a little bit late of what I'm understanding. Um, we do try to work, obviously, work with the team and uh, you know around their baseball schedule. But they do schedule a lot of outside things outside their, like they've mentioned, um, outside their canary season. So there, there's a lot of other use and stuff like that. Um, again, coming from a facility that was outside uh, with down in Waco, um, you, you again are, are very weather dependent um, as far as trying to schedule concerts and, and other events like that. Um, especially during you know whether it's it's too hot, it's too rainy, and stuff like that. And when you we put forth a lot of money um, and effort to try to do those things, I mean it's 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 a real crapshoot um, to try to do those things. So and it, which is a lot more than but oh we got rained out today, we're just going to play two tomorrow or, or something along those lines. So so it is a challenge, but we do work, you know work with the Canary staff to try to maximize those when those opportunities come. Um, but again, it's it's one of those. That we, we we look for those opportunities, but um, you know we're not, we're not actively going out and looking for a full you know repertoire of summer things to to fill in around their baseball schedule because it is a challenge to work with, uh, with weather. So, uh, if the city determines that an amusement park is better use of that <laughs> land, what happens to the Canaries? <laughs> That's a good question. I guess if if, <laughs> if a amusement park took the ballpark over and there was a new ballpark, I guess it would be. Uh, I guess I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> Another one. Um, so you talk about relationship with the business community. You, you mentioned the suites that were built about twenty years ago. Maybe talk about the trends in your four years. With how many of them are filled now or? for the coming year and, and what kind of utilization do you have there? Yeah, last year was our best year um, in 10 years as far as the suites go. And so we have nine suites over there. Two of the suites can, can be opened up into a, a double suite basically for a larger group. Um, our suites come with 20 tickets. Uh, you can get up to 25 with the main staff in our other seating. Um, it's one area that we've seen that that the local businesses really want to want to take advantage of. Our party deck is, a, is based for, for larger groups, and that's a little bit more of the, uh, I don't want to say party scene, but it, it's a lot more social and, and, and less formal than our suites. Um, we have businesses that take advantage of the suites are used for client appreciation, um, employee appreciation, that kind of thing. And, and we've seen with, with a few upgrades we've had, we put in some, some, some blinds, we put in some new carpet, um, and just a few upgrades with, with that, as long as furniture, um, as well as furniture, has, has really gone a long way. So that, that's one area that, one, one trend that we've seen that's that is a little more exclusive, and, and some of the businesses really gravitated towards it. So are you full, do you have a wait list right now for that, or what, is that, what does that look like? We're not full. Weekends, we're, we're usually full. Friday, Saturday, Sundays, we're usually full. Our, 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 our weekday games are a little bit, it varies. Um, out of the nine, we'll usually have, on, on Monday through Thursday, usually four to five sold. Two of them are sold all year round, um, to Orthopedic Institute as well as First Premier Bank, um, and those get utilized every night. Um, I have a few more quick questions, but I'll try to be quick. Um, you alluded to facilities um, in terms of recruiting players. What do you think is the most important thing to increase um, ticket sales? Is it, is it winning? Is it facilities for recruiting players? Is it marketing? Is it fan experience? If you had to pick kind of the bottom hole in the bucket, what would it, what would it be, would you say? For overall attendance, I think weather and, and fan experience is the biggest, biggest contributors with, with, with people attending the games. Um, winning, uh, I think, has been um, 
is less important. I think it's important that we have have exciting games, have games yeah. that we're not even blown That's out right. or aren't you know, ten run swings. Um, so I think, it, and then also having some recognizable talent on the field this year is it, it'll be exciting to see because we have three players on our roster now that have played in the major leagues within the last two years. Um, we have a kid that was drafted in the first round um, three years ago. I mean, there's some, there's some names there that people can kind of kind of gravitate to, and those more traditional fans really like to see that. But yeah, but but for the, the the fans that just come out for for two or three games a year, they really like to pick the games that there's a um, a fun giveaway or um, you know a fun promotion that kind of ties along with that. And the giveaways are one thing that we've seen that that have really really drawn. Last year we did a, a bottle that had a Hall of Fame night for one of our former pitchers. This year we're going to do something similar with Pat Mahomes, um, do a Hall of Fame night and, and bring bring him in. Hopefully he brings his son. Um, so those are the kind of things that really really drive attendance. Thank you. Uh, will the Canaries exercise their options for, it's it's $55,000 a year and right. 2020 goes to 60 for right. five years and then 65 for five years. Will the Canaries exercise those options? Our attention to yes. What's the do you know what the economic impact of the Canaries is? And you might not know how to. This might be something for somebody else to calculate. But do you kind of have you kind of calculated that out from, from the city's perspective? And the reason I ask is the Canaries, as you mentioned, are losing money, and the city lost two hundred thirty-four thousand last year, which I think is a trend. So if both teams, if both parties are losing money, we have to make an economic impact elsewhere. Do you have you got a handle on what that might be? As far as the city side, um, I, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, on our side, again, it, it's getting to the point where it's, it's very encouraging where we're trying to, um, without getting into the specifics, it's, it's very, very close to being a business that, that is obviously you know, cash flowing and sustainable. Um, and over the last five years, it's, it's been getting progressively better every single season. That's great. Um, is, there, is there any concern from ownership if they are? If, it, if they're close to profitable, is that good enough? If they're not profitable, is it okay? Are they gonna pull the plug? Do they need to be profitable at some point or, or this will be a, a problem? You know, can you Yeah, I guess that? that would be a better question for them. Um, I don't believe so. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not in it to make money. Um, they, may, they have other businesses that, that serve, them, serve them well and, and they're doing this more as um, Hobby's not the right term, but they do it because they're passionate about it and they love to do it. Uh, okay, that's great. So, so yeah, no, they're, I don't think it, it makes a huge, huge difference one way or another. Thanks. Any other questions for Joel? Mr. Lee, the floor is yours. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you all for having me. Thank you for the work you're doing in this room to make Sioux Falls uh, bigger, better, and, and hopefully uh, a better place to live for all of us and visit as well for those who don't live here. Um, so the Sports Authority, you all mostly know, we bring sporting events to town, town particularly at the collegiate level. Uh, of course, we help with the Summit League every year, and we have hosted nearly a dozen NCAA championships, mostly at the Division II level. Um, we've also hosted Division I women's championships. So we know that we're a great D2 town. I want to make sure that we uh, prove to the world, that at least the, the country and the NCAA, that we're a great D1 town. And a lot of that is, is what is around the Premier Center. So I'm going to show you some slides here in a little bit of, of what cities that hosted this year's tournament have around their venues. And most of those are downtown venues, right? We know we're not a downtown venue, so we're not gonna have as much around our, our venue, um, but it'd be nice to have a little bit more around our, our venue, just to have a couple, whether it's a hotel, hotels, a restaurant, restaurants, whatever it is, just to give more activity closer to here, uh, would help our chances, again, not just with the NCAA Division I men's basketball, but with other Division I sports at the NCAA level or USOC, you name the big governing body, um, the more we have, I think, around the Premier Center, as well as connectivity from the Premier Center to downtown, um, will boost our chances in hosting those larger events. Um, so that, I told TJ, I only have about two minutes before I lead into the PowerPoint. Stretch, Mike's <laughs> telling me to stretch. 
karaoke. Um, <laughs> can, can you give us a little bit about your background? What, what interests you in the sports world? Sure. So I started, it, it was funny hearing his presentation because I started in minor league baseball. So when he was talking about the cats on the video, uh, we had a promotion in Charlotte at the AAA team uh, for the White Sox, the Charlotte Knights. Uh, every year we would do Bark in the Park where fans could bring their dogs to the stadium and about every half inning we rang a doorbell on the loudspeakers and the entire stadium barked, barked for about 30 seconds because dogs were, Pavlov's dogs, they were thinking somebody was at the door. Um, so as fun as that was, it got annoying and then around the seventh inning it got fun again. Um, but yeah, so I, I did, I did uh, minor league baseball for six years in Charlotte. I, I'm originally from West Virginia. I uh, went to West Virginia University, six years in Charlotte at minor league baseball, and then I moved over to still in the sports world, but working for the CVB there. Uh, so similar to what Terry's operation is here in Sioux Falls, I did the sports um, aspect of that in Charlotte. So um, moved here in August, so I'm, I'm fairly new, but uh, getting the gist of, of what Sioux Falls has to offer and the great history that we've, we've has gotten us to this point. Welcome. Yeah. So, perfect timing, thank you. Uh, perfect timing, we have um, the slides up and I think I have a clicker here, so I'm starting the precedent. Uh, TJ's given me the clicker, so I'm starting the precedent of, of sitting while speaking, uh, or speaking while sitting. But uh, these are just uh, uh, some snippets from the NCAA Division I men's basketball RFP that was released a few years ago. And we expect a similar RFP to be released um, probably later this year for years tw um, 2023 through probably 2026. So it's gonna be a four year stretch that Sioux Falls and, and cities around the country are gonna bid on division one, two, and, and three championships at the NCAA level. So uh, again, this is the snippet from the previous bid cycle, but I assume uh, this language and additional language will be in uh, the next cycle coming up. Uh, venue, we check this list, of course, uh, seating capacity for division one men's is 10,000 seats. And, uh, you know, they, they put a note in there. This is all copy pasted straight from the RFP, though preference may be given to sites with a larger capacity. Uh, then we get to the hotel portion of it. And here's what, uh, again, per the RFP, the host, uh, the host city essentially shall reserve first class full service hotels with full service restaurants with room service for the participating teams, which if we hosted a first and second round, that would be eight teams a media hotel, a game officials hotel, and of course at competitive rates. Uh, the next line, it is permissible for the headquarter hotel, uh, think NCAA staff and dignitaries, to uh, be in a select service hotel with full service amenities. Meeting space in each of those team hotels, uh, and there needs to be three meeting rooms, each measuring 1,200 square feet. There's a potential, instead of having eight full service hotels, maybe we could have six and double a couple teams up in, in two of the largest hotels. Uh, that is permissible by the NCAA, but regardless, you can see the amount of full service uh, needs that they have uh, at the D1 level, as well as the meeting space requirements that they have. Uh, and then just quickly at the bottom, I have team room block um, for each of those eight team hotels. Uh, we would need 75 rooms per night uh, just for their block. <coughs> And then, of course, no casino can be attached um, to any, any contracted NCAA hotel. So that's a quick snippet or, or snapshot of the venues and hotels, uh, the requirements there. The next few slides are going to be what I mentioned earlier, maps of other cities uh, that hosted in 2019. And then I'll even get a little further into the cities that are more similar to our size in 2021 20, and 22. So the cities that you're going to see now, uh, some of which are similar to us, the first few that you're going to see are San Jose, Salt Lake City. We know we're not similar in size, uh, but to put all of the 2019 uh, venues in there, I, I thought we might as well include the, the large and the small. Before you flip to that, can sure. you talk about how we're doing, checking the boxes on all these? Yep, and TJ, I don't know, I, I thought I was clicking forward. If I need to stand, I'll be happy to. And I'm sorry, what was your question, Tony? Oh, just how we're, you go through that yeah, so, okay. as, as we stand today. Sure, so, so venue, of course, we, we've already discussed and, and we know we have a great venue. Um, we have full service hotels here. Uh, we probably have five or six, um, not all of which would have the 1,200 square feet space. So potentially there's some wiggle room. If, if we could find a room, let's say with 2,000 square feet, maybe there's some wiggle room on the back end to have a room with a little bit lesser 
um, requirement. So we need full service hotels. Whether they're here on this campus, whether they're somewhere else in the city, um, that remains a lot of it for this group to decide. Uh, again, the walkability would be great. So if it, if it was somewhere here on this campus, uh, that would bode well for us. Um, but it's, it's all, at this level, and, and we're talking NCAA, but whether it's USOC or another large governing body, it is, it is full service uh, amenities is what they're looking for. Size, space, uh, and the amenities that come along with those types of hotels. So we're doing okay. Uh, I think currently we could host this, but with the maps that you're about ready to see, and, and I don't even have the hotels listed, I just have a 500 or 200 foot shot of the venue and then what's around that. Um, I'm not talking about the, the hotels that are two miles away or one mile away uh, or 10 miles away off of the interstate that may also be full service hotels. So, so when you see this, uh, you'll see all the hotels and restaurants that are in walking distance. So we're doing okay. We know we have hotels, great restaurants. They're just not incredibly conveniently located to this campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we check the boxes, okay. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Yeah, and enough, enough to put on a successful tournament. But when we're bidding <coughs> on events like this, we're not just bidding against cities our size or cities that, that we know we're better than in, in these amenities. We're bidding against Nashville and, and Chicago or Charlotte or Orlando, cities that do this every day. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they put on these big events every day regardless of what the actual event is. Um, they, they know they have the, the space for them. I know we can find the space for them, but it, it wouldn't be as easy as probably those bigger cities. Okay, so let's see if this click works now. So, just let me know. yep. Uh, so San Jose again. These these first few are going to be cities that are bigger than us. And in fact, TJ, I'll just stand up since sure. I'm going to slide through these pretty quickly. Um, What's the radius here? Most of these are going to be 500 feet. Um, when, you, when you're on Google Maps, you know how you can scroll forward or backwards. Uh, this, is, this is on uh, that setting at 500 feet. And so essentially everything's walkable. We're talking that, that highest circle up at the tops, uh, certainly not going to be a mile, but maybe a half mile away. Same thing with the lowest circle on the bottom. So uh, the point we did, the reason we did 500 or 200 was just to show the walkability of these venues. So again, I'm not going to spend too much time on each of this, these cities. I just want to uh, go through these 15 or 20 slides fairly quickly just so you can get a sense of what each city has. So uh, if you can see the colors, the green in the center or the yellow arrow is going to be the actual venue, the competition venue where the NCAA uh, took place <coughs> this year, 2019, just last month. Uh, and then the red is going to be restaurants, blue is going to be, uh, blue or purple is going to be hotels. And in some of these, so I'll even sidetrack myself, if you scrolled in more, more hotels would pop up or more restaurants would pop up. If you scrolled out a wider view, more hotels, more restaurants would pop up. So this is just simply what Google Maps has given us. Salt Lake City. <coughs> This is Jacksonville. Jacksonville is interesting um, because what does not pop up is their landing, which is just going to be here along the river, um, probably a half mile away. But the landing is, is probably 30 restaurants and or bars uh, in that venue. Uh, so again, these are the venues that hosted this year. Columbus, you see Nationwide Arena there in the middle and everything mostly walkable uh, to Nationwide Arena. Now we're getting into the cities a little more similar to Sioux Falls' size. Columbia, and I think if they can host it, I know we can host it. Uh, they have great amenities. You see a lot of circles here on this map, um, but hopefully we can get to that point as well at some point. So Colonial Life is in the middle, and you can see the hotels and restaurants surrounding uh, the Columbia venue. Tulsa, Des Moines, Hartford, Connecticut. And those larger red, if you can't see, uh, a lot of them have multiple restaurants in the one circle. <clears throat> Greenville, South Carolina, a city that I think is very similar to, uh, to Sioux Falls. They have a beautiful river and rapids that go right through downtown. And um, yeah, it's just, it has a Sioux Falls <coughs> feel or Sioux Falls has a Greenville feel. So uh, both great cities, of course. Here's Omaha. Again, a little bit bigger, um, a lot bigger than Sioux Falls, but in our region, 
And then here's our next slide, Sioux Falls. So again, we know we have the hotels and restaurants <laughs> near the mall, near the downtown. This just provides what is around the Premier Center. Uh, on the top right, which did not get circled, it's kind of cut off, is Casa del Rey. So we know that's a restaurant. Um, we're, we're now closer to that mile range, but uh, we know that's there. And then in the top left, it did not show up, I think, until we scrolled even maybe to 100 feet. But it was uh, the Holiday Inn Express and the um, Crooked Pipe that are there. So if you add those two circles, that's, that's what we have immediately around the Premier Center. So these next slides are going to be the cities. Now we're getting away from the larger cities. That was all 2019. These are cities that are going to be hosting the same tournament, B1 men's basketball in um, 20, 21, and 22, that are similar to our size. Providence, Rhode Island. Spokane. Now, I, I made a note here at the bottom at Spokane. They're about a mile from downtown. Um, maybe walkable, but a lot of those fans are going to drive uh, from downtown to, to the arena. What they do for large events, I understand, uh, and I assume they'll do this next year for uh, basketball, is they use city buses in a continual loop on the days that the events are taking place at the uh, arena. So at least there is that connectivity from the arena to downtown. Some people may choose to walk regardless, but at least they're providing that option. Uh, Greensboro Coliseum also, or Greensboro, North Carolina, the Coliseum is also a couple miles from downtown. They've tried similar methods of, of transportation. Uh, sometimes it's worked, sometimes it hasn't. So uh, I have friends there, so it's good to get uh, the pros and cons of, of what they've done in the past uh, and how maybe we can implement that in the future. Lexington, Kentucky, this is on UK's campus. So maybe not quite downtown Lexington, but it has a downtown feel because there's gonna be a lot on, uh, to do or stay on a campus setting. Here's Boise, more similar to us in size and uh, walkability. Again, this is gonna be on their campus as well. Albany, New York. And there's just quickly Sioux Falls again. That is the presentation. Um, I don't want to, I have suggestions, not answers. Uh, I think that's what you all are probably trying to find. Um, but we have the need. If we want to host NCAA D1, uh, larger events like that, and we talk mm -hmm. basketball, but volleyball championships at the D1 level, wrestling, um, uh, women's basketball again, the Frozen Four, hockey, this is what the other cities have done or are continuing to do is, is to build more of that campus up. And uh, whether that's full service hotels and or restaurants and or the connectivity to a, a, a larger area of that town and our sake of downtown um, are, are things that we would need if, if we want to be competitive in, in these situations. And I am happy, that is it, I, I was short, I don't know about sweet. Um, but I am, happy, I am happy to answer any questions that you all have. What about airport connectivity? Is that a consideration that's in? Uh, I know what you're showing us is more of the hotel, restaurant, that type of thing, but how do we, uh, how do we stack up in terms of airport? Um, we're competitive in a lot of things. So even, even these blank spaces where we don't have circles here, uh, we can use that towards our advantage because we have parking. A lot of these venues don't have great parking around their venues. Um, a lot of these airports in these cities are 15 to 20 miles out. Ours is not. So yes, all of those things um, are, can and will be used towards our advantage. Uh, that is our selling point. Uh, we're not downtown, but, uh, and we're not a, a million you know, population city, but that's a good thing and here's why. And the airport certainly is one of those things. Yes, a sir? Of this, a lot of the cities uh, that you listen to your slides that are comparable to Sioux Falls, like Boise, Spokane, uh, Lexington, Columbus, Providence, they're all home to major Division I mm -hmm. schools. The location and size of our Division I universities is not being in Sioux Falls, is that a hindrance to our competitive? I don't think so. Uh, the two schools, north and south of us, are really close, and we're the home of the Summit League now. The Summit League has a track record of putting a ton of people in this venue in March, and, um, and, and that's Honestly, the Summit League is why we would probably host, or at least one of the reasons why we keep hosting these D2 or the D1 Women Championships. Uh, we've proven ourselves. The resume's there, the Summit League started that resume. Um, 
and we're now building off of that. So uh, I don't have any issues with a major program not being within 10 miles of the city, uh, and, and a lot of the cities don't have that either. Um, Salt Lake City doesn't. I guess they have Utah, but if I went back through there, there's some bigger cities that wouldn't have that. Charlotte, we host it in Charlotte. We don't have a major program. We have UNC Charlotte, um, but Duke is an hour and a half or two hours away. UNC is, is an hour and a half, two hours away. So um, as long as we have the two schools, uh, north and south of us on our side, uh, and of course the Summit League, um, then we're in good shape. Thomas, can you mention it when you first started talking? The cycle for applying for 23 would be the next mm -hmm. available year. What is that? Uh, refresh from memory. And yeah, so, so the NCAA essentially does four-year cycles, of, uh, mm -hmm. and they do it about two or three years in advance of that cycle actually happening. So uh, we're in 2019, and 2023 would be the first year of that next cycle. Uh, so we are anticipating later this year, again, or early next year, that the NCAA on their website, uh, via newsletter, emails, whatever it is, they're going to blast all the cities out there, um, the conferences, the host institutions, uh, everybody that would have an uh, impact uh, in bringing an event like this to their city, they're going to say, here they are, right? They're going to say, here are four years of, of D1, D2 championships and all the various sports. Uh, you have six months, five months, whatever it is to get us what we need. And it's all electronic, um, but there's going to be, uh, you know, we talked about venues and hotel information. Of course, that's going to be included, um, but there's a list of other things. What can you provide services? What are the ancillaries? Uh, how will you welcome the teams to town? How will you make this really truly feel like a special uh, environment city for their team? So it's, it's, it is a four month process to put that together. And again, we're going to be bidding on, let's say we put 15 bids together for the various sports in the various years. Uh, so it is, it is challenging. It's fun, but it's, it's a process to do that and make sure that um, we have everything that they're asking for but we, we need more than that. So um, we can have the full service hotels barely, we can have the restaurants that they, they would love to have nearby, but if we don't have the ancillaries, and a lot of that's creativity on my side. How can we welcome these teams? How can we maybe shuttle the teams from the hotels to the arena? Um, a lot of that is, is on the back end, but um, the glaring uh, first two things is can you check off the venue capacity? Yes, and do you have enough hotels to service not just the teams, media officials headquarters but also the fans yes sir <coughs> so um, on the venue requirement sheet that you had up there was the meeting room requirement you <coughs> tell us, is there ever a, a case where because the convention center is adjacent yes. to the premier center yeah. that that gives us some leeway and, and a Teams actually prefer that? Uh, I don't know if they prefer it. Uh, they wouldn't mind it. it it's, it's, they're indifferent as long as they have the space and it's, it's close enough. Um, we would probably use one of the ballrooms or, or some of the meeting space for a fan fest or some sort of activity, um, but there's a lot of space in this venue. And so yes, if we had a team stay at the Sheraton and or another hotel that was, was close by, um, we could easily incorporate this meeting space into those teams needs meeting space. Thomas, can you talk a little bit about just the economic impact? So let's say Sioux Falls is also like a Sweet 16 tournament. Like how many fans would be coming into Sioux Falls? What kind of, how many nights would they stay? Yep, so you, know, you wouldn't know who you're even hosting until the Sunday before. Right. So it, it's kind of madness, March Madness, uh, getting even just knowing who, you're, who, who is coming to your town. So hopefully you're going to get a couple uh, crazed fan bases that travel to see their teams. And it would have probably be at the sweet, sweet 16 level, it would be at the, the, the field of 64 level. Um, so we would hopefully, hopefully in the first, second rounds host eight teams. And you don't know that answer really. Um, you, can, you can do averages and uh, the, the turnouts are great. It is, they're, they're, they're very impactful. You would play four games on one day, whether that's Thursday and Friday, and then you would play two games on either that Saturday or Sunday, two days, you know, fast forward past the first round. Um, you could expect near sellouts for each of those, and a lot of those are gonna be visitors. Uh, they're not just the people driving from 30 minutes away. They're, they're flying in, they're driving hours to be here to watch their teams. Uh, so if we, if we seat 12,000 here in our venue, I think it's safe to say close to six would be visitors. Um, maybe four to five would be visitors, but true visitors, not, not people from an hour away, people from, from five to, to who knows how far away. 
Yes. So presuming you're proposing that the ideal situation is a couple of more full service hotels and a few more restaurants within 500 feet, what's your suggestion you mentioned you might have a few? Uh, so 500 feet would be the parking lot. So 500 feet view is probably within a mile radius. Um, again, I'm speaking for NCAA only, fun places, uh, whether it's family oriented or, or alumni that are trying to get a beer before or after the game. Um, not necessarily fancy sit down restaurants that take a while, but more let's socialize, right? These are all socialized places. Um, as far as the brand names of, the, of a hotel or restaurant, you can pick those sorts of, of places. Um, but that's, that's the gist, is, is how do we get people here when they get here on a Wednesday or Thursday to watch their team play, park, and not touch their car again for three or four days until they leave. So are you, are you proposing that, it, that we, we need to build something here or a shuttle system? Or what, what, do you have any other kind of suggestions? And, and or. Um, so yes, if, if, and I don't know what happens at the end of this meeting. I, I don't, you know, once you make your suggestions, it's not like you're going to say, all right, here's, here's our hotel or here's our amusement park. It's not going to be that easy. Um, but yes, I, I would simply suggest a, a full service hotel. Um, restaurants, I, I know, you know, this is, this is, I guess, a wish list. Um, and then also connectivity uh, to downtown. So this isn't going to be on a random Wednesday connectivity. This is going to be whenever Terry has large conventions here or we have large sporting events or of course Mike is, is hosting sporting events and concerts as well. But how do we shrink that two mile gap between downtown and the Premier Center? And you do that by again, whether they stay downtown um, or they stay here, hopefully even if they stay downtown, they park their car and because we're shuttling so often, uh, so easily, it's so accessible, they don't have to drive again for three or four days. Do you know like what kind of weight it would take to shuttle like at these other places? Is it a 10 minute, 30 minute? Um, it, it's about every 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it's about every 15 minutes there's going to be a bus leave and come back. Do you know offhand if uh, the city's chosen benefit from the television contracts in any sort of way? I mean, March Madness is a made-for-TV event, you know? So yeah. Do they benefit economically from Sure, I, I, think, I think just the eyeballs on Sioux Falls. Yeah. Uh, of course, there, there's going to be B-roll of our city. Uh, Sioux Falls is going to be written on the court. Uh, the Summit League or whichever of the host institutions uh, will get benefit uh, similar to that as well. Similar when we had the rodeo here. I was watching on CBS. I got to see Sioux Falls. Um, it, it's, it's, more it's, it's, right? it's more exposure. It's marketing, but you can't necessarily put a price to it or a value to it. I'll add something. I'm, I'm on the Sports Authority Board and Thomas is the third uh, executive director that I've been able to sit through and as we get feedback from the NCAA, they're starting to know who Sioux Falls is. Certainly with the, what we've done with the Summit League has been huge. Now with the Sanford International Tournament, that gives us a lot of exposure. But we do get feedback on a consistent basis. Oh, you don't have enough quality hotels. I mean, if you're flying in from pick a state, you, a lot of these people want that higher caliber motel that they're used to if they go travel to a New York or Chicago. And we're putting ourselves out there to be, uh, it's unfair to compare, compare us to Fargo and Sioux City anymore. We should think Des Moines, Omaha, Boise, the bigger cities like that. That's our next step. Mm -hmm. And so as Thomas talks about the connectivity and the restaurants and the hotels that need to be out close to out here for us to get to that next step. Uh, we, we've heard that for years, and now with the Premier Center being here, there's no excuse for us not to do something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's an exciting time to look forward. He talked, uh, talk about the marketability of the arena. Uh, you guys are promoting that facility, or are we on that stage? This arena down here. Um, Again, speaking just solely from Sports Authority, it's probably not much use to us. I don't think we've hosted an event there for years. Again, I started in August, September of last year, um, but I think you've got to go back to when the Summit League used it, or maybe at one point the Summit League used it for a fan fest. But again, there's enough space in this convention center to accommodate uh, a, an event like that. Uh, as far as a competition playing in there, we have this, of course, the Premier Center for large events, but you have the Pentagon two miles away. That is 
five years old and just a beautiful, unique facility um, that any event organizer would rather play in than the arena. I think is that, is that basketball court used all for warm ups or practices when these teams come into town? Um, it could be, yeah, it could be. I, I think <laughs> if 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 the arena wasn't there, we could still get by with, with the Pentagon um, or even local high schools or the colleges that would offer up their courts to the teams. Uh, they don't necessarily warm up before the game except for, um, you know, it's similar to the Summit League. Summit League teams before each of their games have 45 minutes on the main court to warm up. So it's not like they're saying, uh, you know, one game ends and the next one's 10 minutes from then. They have ample amount of time to warm up and there doesn't need to be uh, ancillary practice court right on the site. Yes? Do you have a, maybe based on some of your connections or other communities you worked at, do you have a pretty good understanding of what it would cost and if we have the ability to bus now, uh, that is, do we have enough buses and the time of day and what's the cost to yeah. do that hiring? And I, I don't. I don't know that. I don't know even what our number of buses are. Um, in one of the cities, I'll, I'll leave nameless, I've talked to them, and they said they tried to, to duplicate um, Spokane's model, and the private charter buses got angry because uh, they weren't utilizing them and paying for them, they were using their own city buses. Well, as a city, I think we need to make the most economic sense, and, and if that's our city buses, um, but as far as the data and how many we have, uh, I, I don't know that. Or if, if we would need more. Good, good, good question that I don't know the answer to. But with the Summit League, we're not currently utilizing buses to get people from downtown out there. No, and I might ask Terry on this one. You know, we have, we have a lot of parking. And this year's Summit League was a little bit uh, different just because we had the sportsman show going on at the same time. So when you have two large events happening, I think, yeah, there, there wasn't any shuttling going on. There, there no, was enough and, parking. And when it comes right down to it, a large percentage of Summit League traffic is drive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the folks that do come in from out of town from the, the teams that are from, um, you know, further out, if they do fly in, um, you know, we're so close to the airport that they might just shuttle over with the Sheraton or whoever and um, park it and hang around here for the tournament. Or, um, you know, maybe the Sheraton will shuttle them someplace. Um, but it's mm -hmm. pretty much just come in and... <clears throat> the Summit League does not draw as many hotel rooms as you might think because <coughs> of, you know, South Dakota schools being in and in North Dakota. It, it just doesn't... It's a fabulous tournament for Sioux Falls, but it doesn't create as many room nights as you think it does. Yes, sir. Um, so, <clears throat> the city of Sioux Falls right now, the core team is focusing on transportation transit issues right now. Is this something that could be maybe addressed in that group as well to look at opportunities to shuttle people for big tournaments like that? You know, what they're talking about, I think they're talking about like substation shuttle to bring people to the transit system. Mm -hmm. This might be an opportunity to talk about um, addressing it that way, having hotels downtown shuttling people back. Sure, and I can connect with TJ about possibly meeting with that group as well, or Terry and I meeting with that group, but um, I'd be all for that. And that's something that the parking and kind of every small group, we want that group to look at that as yeah. well. But the core team is also looking at connectivity kind of with this campus. The real tricky part of that is, as I'm sure you know, is that it's so sporadic. Yeah. So much of our business is, is fly drive, <clears throat> and um, so do we really, I mean, we've tried it before, and it, they didn't really want to use the, the trolley or the bus. And then another group might come in and they might really want it. So to have it on a permanent basis um, probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. To try to use it per group um, would make more sense, but I'm not real sure how we could guarantee even that, that there would be X number of riders, and yet we need to have it available. And that could be a case by case. You, yes. you do it a few times, see what happens, and, and mm -hmm. add or delete shuttles from there. Yeah. Is, is it your 
maybe both bidding on particular events. I mean, is that is that something that maybe tips you over the edge versus somebody else if you're at it, at least including that as an option, or is that just so far down the list that doesn't really matter? No, we're seeing it. I, the larger and more national groups, we're seeing it as an issue, especially for those who want to be downtown. It, it moves the needle, for sure. Terry, is there a way to kind of study the overall economic impact of making improvements here versus shuttling and the economic impact that it would have downtown? Is there information like that? I don't know. Well, I'm sure, um, I would think there could be. It might be a little tricky because we don't know, um, we, don't, we don't really have them downtown t to know, but um, yeah. I don't know. We're, we're in the midst of beginning a big research project that I'm going to talk about when, when my turn comes around. So it's something that I could ask about. We talked a lot about D1 basketball, and I, I'm assuming that you know, that's kind of the capstone of the world you live in. Are there other things that you're looking at working on where other amenities or the scope of this group should be thinking about. Yeah, so I, I chose D1 basketball because that's in, in, the, in the sense of needs, if you build a pyramid of what, you know, shy of the hosting the NBA All-Star Game or the Super Bowl or the Final Four, which we know we're not going to host, um, that's reasonable for Sioux Falls to host, that's the pinnacle. And so I use that as the example. So the hotels that, that D1 would need, uh, the, of course, the venue, the, the walkability that they prefer, the ancillaries that they want. <clears throat> that's that would entail other groups um, that size or smaller that that could come here and fit here easily so that that was why I use that example if we had a flashy new baseball stadium somewhere in town is there an opportunity for more baseball events or with the way that NCAA is set up in Omaha is there any opportunity to <coughs> Anything Potentially, yeah, we could we could certainly host. We haven't before, but we could host, um, you know, bid to host NCAA regionals leading up to um, leading up to Omaha. Now, I, I I I don't I've never worked with NCAA baseball. I don't even know if those regional rounds are on campuses. They might be on the on the home field campus, but if they're not, then that's something a new stadium uh, can certainly provide. What we did in in my old minor league uh, in Charlotte at the minor league team was we would have USA baseball come in uh, once a year and play blank country and, and that would produce you know 80 percent full capacity uh, we would host christian concerts so it wasn't always just sports related um, baseball you can only put baseball in baseball right like like you can put a lot of sports in the premier center you could put a lot of sports on a soccer field or a football field um, you can't do much else with baseball so it's either baseball or a concert like we did there Any other questions for Thomas? And, and I'll even go back to that. So Summit League um, or, or any league conference that is close enough to here could potentially play there. Uh, if we had a new flashy stadium, maybe South Dakota State or South Dakota could play a couple home games there. Uh, so there are opportunities. I guess what I'm saying is they would be baseball opportunities. It's, it's not like we could bring other sports, of course, to fit in a baseball stadium. So as this loads, um, I'll preface what I have to say and what I'm going to show you today. Um, I am obviously the, the new kid on the block. Um, I've been here about seven weeks now. So in, enjoying my time, um, looking, learning a lot, and um, trying to take what I've seen in my 30 years in a number of different markets um, and trying to apply that to what Sioux Falls could do um, and, and, and just and try to be that that person that's that's old that has been around a lot of places um, for that. Um, so basically, what I wanted to hear. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit today about obviously um, not so much the Premier Center, uh, but the other two portions of our campus that are um, a little bit more dated 
um, that, uh, that I see as opportunity for the community, um, for additional revenue, for additional events, um, such as Thomas talked about, which is I'm sure what Terry will talk about too, as far as um, you know, bigger conventions, sports type things, um, added revenue as, uh, based on with hotels and everything like that. So certainly right here, you know, I, this is basically the last three years um, in the arena itself, in the old Sioux Falls arena, um, days in use. Um, and then I basically broke it down, obviously, with events, flat space, which are basically like when we do convention space, either it's in conjunction with the, the space that we have in the convention hall that we spill over into the arena because we are out of space. They take up everything. And the, some of them will even go into the Premier Center and use that as flat space. Um, and then the percentage, the, the number of events that we actually use the retractable bleachers where we use seating. So this might be in conjunction with a, a trade show that they have some breakout sessions and they, and they utilize those. Uh, I think Sportsman Show does a little bit of that, um, those type of things. And then I threw in Augustana and uh, the Roller Dolls, which are both uh, are not, no longer here, but that kind of gives you an idea of just the amount of usage and obviously we've seen it decline greatly. And, and part of that obviously is because some of our tenants have left, um, but also because uh, the datedness of the facility. Um, as was mentioned before, as Thomas mentioned, you know, do we get a lot of people that want to just come in and say, hey, we want to rent the arena space. And, and if they know the arena, if they've been walking over there, and I'm assuming you all have walked um, and done a campus tour, um, it is very dated. Uh, it's, uh, so I have some suggestions about that, which we'll, we'll get to. Um, but that, that, this kind of, again, I'm a big bar graph type person because it shows you all have the numbers and probably have seen the numbers before as it relates to revenue and everything like that. But sometimes I feel it's more impactful if we see a bar graph because we see trends. And it's, it's just a little bit more on the visual that way. So um, as we relate to food and beverage, <clears throat> um, these are from our, our good friends at Spectra. Um, as far as the number of banquets that we've seen, and obviously, and obviously I had to skew the, skew the attendance here in thousands because otherwise it would have been off and everything else would have looked funny. So, um, you know, we, we see that we're, 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 tre we're trending pretty well um, as far as that goes. Obviously, this year to date, you know, we're, we're um, it's still early in the year. Um, did, but we've done a number of great shows, uh, banquet shows already. Um, this year we had one last night, it was fantastic, almost a, right at a thousand people. Um, so our, our revenue is, is good there, our events are get, good there, but we do again run out of, we do run out of flat space. We do run out, um, and the ability for Spectra to serve large facilities like that, like when they do large things. We almost need an additional kitchen. I mean, and I'm sure Chad wouldn't be opposed to an additional kitchen to serve food. We look at Nut Loss, Stadium Arena Convention Center. Obviously, the arena um, factors into this as well um, over the last couple, couple years. And so we have a convention center, arena, stadium. I don't have a stadium for the last couple of years because SMG just took over from this last year. So those are the numbers from, from, um, from last year. Um, but we are putting a lot of money into the stadium and to the arena just for basic upgrades. So HVAC, seat replacement to get to keep it up to code. Um, and we're not seeing that return in its current state as far as the revenue is concerned. Um, and so as a caretaker for the facility, we are certainly cognizant of that. And that's why we, you know, we have come together <laughs> as a team. Um, both SMG um, had conversations obviously with Spectra, with the CVB, everything like that, um, and what, of what we would like to see. So repair and maintenance dollars for the arena and the stadium, which kind of gives you an idea of basically what is in the city budget and what has been paid over the last several years and what's projected out for the next couple of years um, for the figures that I was able to get. Um, it, it's, you know, we're, we're in a, as Duel mentioned, we're in a um, 
maintenance and repair project or capital improvement project, whatever we want to call it, for the stadium basically to get it up to code because there's some structural defects um, where it's, it's not safe. And if we don't repair those issues, it certainly opens us up from a liability issue as far as trip and falls, different things like that. There's some safety netting, which has really become the standard. Um, hockey started that a number of years ago um, behind the goals. Baseball's taken over that. Um, and they've gone, Major League Baseball has even gone so far to extend it all the way down to, um, down the, the first and third base lines well past the dugouts over the last couple of years because they've had injuries and everything like that. It becomes a, a really more of a, a PR nightmare and liability nightmare for them if somebody gets injured. So we, we see that and that's we're in the process of adding some additional netting right now as well um, over at the stadium. Um, but again, we, we've, we've heard about the ticket sales, we've heard about the loss and everything like that. So again, just all factors to consider as we're, as we're putting money into these facilities. So with the facilities that are dated, we talk about lost business. Um, and this was in conjunction with um, my sales staff here at the convention center. Um, also, we talked with, uh, with Terry, um, uh, with the CVB. But just in this, this is the last year basically. Um, we, we had to turn away 35 events because we did not have any more space. Which would, that would have been 50 days of use if we would have had more space. Um, so the potential $365,000 that we had to just turn away because we are out of space. So currently 32 clients utilize 100% of convention space. So as I mentioned, dairy farmers, um, home show, different things like that. Uh, we surveyed all those all those people. 72% said they would, if there was more space available, they would book that space because there's opportunity to grow. Um, they enjoy the facilities. They enjoy um, dealing with our staff, everything like that. They enjoy the community. And, and again, geography is a good friend to ours um, as it relates to travel for some of these shows. Um, talking to Sheraton, over the last, uh, uh, since 2018, this room night revenue, you can see how much they lost. They turned, had to turn away because didn't have that. Now, I'm not saying we add another 12 floors to the Sheraton, but that just gives you an idea, again, of the room nights that when we have big concerts, when we have a big concert in the Premier Center, they're sold out. Any big event in the convention hall, they're pretty much sold out. So that just gives you an idea. Hey, Mike. Yes, sir. On the, that's, that stat of the 72% would book more space, did yes. the survey include how much more space they would, they would book if it was available? Or well, we, was we, did, we didn't really get into, you know, hey, if we have another 20,000 square feet, would you utilize that? But, there, but typically, you know, when, if they're booking, you know, the, our, basically our 50,000 square feet, you know, if they're going to grow, it's probably going to be an additional, you know, 15 to 20,000 square feet. They're not going to just say, hey, we're, we're going to book 1,000 square feet. So there, it's going to be a substantial growth. Um, when we come to the, we did the, the home shows, some of these out here, they're doing their booths out into the concourse area here because we do not have any more room for them in regular flat space. They are taking up, you know, all the arena space, all of our convention hall space. and. To, you know, so they have vendors, additional vendors that they're selling, and that's the only place that we can put them. Which, when we have a hockey game or other event in the Premier Center, now those fans are kind of walking through those things. It's not ideal, but we're trying to do the best we can and accommodate everybody that we can. Thank you. So, now we get into the fun stuff. We get into the, the mind of Mike, which is a scary place. So... <laughs> Read a diagram, it's kind of hard to sit what, like that, but in, in my mind, if we were to, and I know there are some sensitivities in the community regarding the, the, the arena, um, that's, you know, it's been here a long time, everything like that. If we were to gut the building, if we were to gut it, just left the, the ceiling or the, the roof and the outside walls, the exterior walls. And then we put in service corridors and we put in additional kitchen space to serve those type of things. We would approximately get 34,200 uh, square feet. And I say per floor because my idea is to go double. It is a tall ceiling to begin with. 
So you could get two floors. You could get something com comparable to what we have that is a ceiling height in the convention center right now for flat floor space, and then add a second floor, which is more traditional ballroom. So you're, you, we would, at 68,500 feet, we would more than double our size of our convention center right now. Um, with also, again, being sensitive to the architecture of the arena, and it's been iconic since the 60s, et cetera, et cetera, um, to do that, as opposed to just knocking it down and, con and continuing the architecture of the, of the convention center. So just, again, an option. But what that does is upgraded facilities, upgraded AV, everything like that. Be um, we potentially could, I have another slide where I'm sensitive to where the previous slide, the um, seating was used, risers were used. Um, we, the, we could construct a riser system that say had 2,000 seats and we could hold smaller graduations, different things like that, in the flat floor space of the arena. So we're not just saying, sorry that if you, if you no longer fit that, you know, the flat floor space, everything like that, we, we don't want you there. But the, it's, the more amenities that we have, the more opportunity we have for a bunch of different things. How do you put together cost estimates with these things, or these are just ideas? No, these are, these are ideas, and like I say, and I was, I was going to preface this by saying, um, this was a, a mock-up that one of my staff did. Um, I, I am not an architect, <laughs> and I can barely draw, so that's why I had, I had them. But in my, again, in my mind, and talking with some of the other people in the community, you know, this potentially could be what the campus looks like. So you still have the Sioux Falls Arena architecture, but there's a parking deck, parking structure, one or two full service hotels where the current baseball resides. Um, and, and what this does, I mean, say if it was a, and I have a slide on it later, um, you know, parking structures are very expensive to, to create. You know, anywhere between, you know, 23, $25,000, depending on the market, to, per space. So if you created a five to 600 space parking garage, you know, you're looking up over probably $10 million. Um, my vision is not to have the, that as a city encumberment, but for the hotel company to come in and that'd be a cost because then they could monetize it. And who wouldn't pay 20 bucks to park in a parking structure when it's snowing and everything like that? Even though we offer free parking here, I, I certainly believe and the people I've talked to certainly would not have a problem to park close to the front door of the convention center or the premier center for $20. Another slide, this is with the current architecture or like that. Again, that's just something that I, that I see. Um, creating more space, more hotels, more parking, which is always a concern of its, um, and what I've heard since I've been here. This just gives you a slide. This is not a, again, I didn't draw this. Um, the lines are much too straight. The, but, it, it, but it has basically an expo center and then a ballroom on top with some pre-function space, different things like that. That could easily be architectured inside of the current arena that we have. So. So some added convention center info. So I mentioned before about the additional square foot um, that we can, we can garner, um, that it doubles it. The, all rooms would be um, used with air walls. So we just, you wouldn't, if you had a, something that you only needed 10,000 square feet up top that you didn't have to use, the, utilize the whole space. We can, more, again, take care of more clients. If it's, you know, the more air walls you have, the more divisible you have your room, the more flexible you are. I mentioned the retractable riser system. It can be engineered. Um, it takes care of small events, graduations, things like that. I mentioned the, the additional kitchen as well that would be able to utilize and serve this side of the campus. Additional hotel benefits. As Thomas mentioned before about NCAA and potentially a first floor, um, larger conventions that, that Terry is, is constantly giving us leads and trying to get us you know, in here, um, that would 
satisfy them for as far as um, on-site hotel rooms and park room. Um, if we're building, that's more jobs. It's more jobs for, for local businesses, everything like that. The economy, to me, it's, it's, it's a win for the economy as well, and to staff those positions. When we add more rooms, more hotel rooms and stuff like that, the need for, need for um, workers. Here's my parking structure notes. So I had it at 23,000. I think this was this year's one of the one of the things I pulled off the website. So the 500 parking space, 11.5 million. You amortize it over 30 years, which that's typically what most parking structures they say they go for. 383 thousand dollars really doesn't sound that bad. Um, 30 dates a year with the structures at full capacity, at 20 dollars a car. That's 300 thousand. Just those 30 dates. So to me, it's as a business person, I would say, you know what, that's, that's a chance for revenue to even get back and break even on my, on my um, initial investment. Um, if you didn't need the top floor, you could utilize for rooftop parties or other functions during the summer. I would love to have the opportunity to do that. Pre-concert parties at the top deck of the, you know, during the summer and stuff like that. <clears throat> Now, I mentioned, T talked to TJ earlier. <clears throat> he mentioned there's a couple buildings, and I think I mentioned maybe at the last meeting, um, where one of our facilities in Long Beach, they had an older arena, and they totally changed it and to this. They put in a rigging grid. They basically gutted the lower level, and then they're able to do that. Now, the couple differences between our arena here and what they have in Long Beach. One, if you note the, the shape, Long Beach Arena is more of an oval and they had seating around it. Um, ours is, is, is not that way. Um, you know, they had a need, I had a note here. So Long Beach Arena, um, they added, um, well they had 572,000 square feet of convention space. So obviously they didn't feel that they, they were running out per se, but they needed something to do with the egg older arena. And so they created this space that now adds an additional 96,000 square feet, but it's, a little, it's different because obviously, like I said, the, the lights, they have a curtaining system that kind of goes around so you can block off viewing the, the existing seating. They can still do some functionality in there as far as some, some concerts and different things like that. But that's, again, that's something that's, like that. We do not have a, a, a traditional rigging grid in this building. Um, and they, like I said, and they brought all that in and that, that it, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. If you ever get a chance to either go on the website, um, which is again, one of our buildings, um, to take a look at that. The other instance we found was in Detroit. Uh, Joe Lewis Arena, which is all part of the Cobo Center, um, Convention Center. Um, again, when the Palace at Auburn Hills opened, basically Joe Lewis Arena got shuttered. And it was shuttered for a number of years until they decided to put the investment in and turn it into flat floor space. Um, I did not find a lot of other references. And I talked to some of my industry peeps last night. And so this is not a common occurrence where somebody takes an older arena and suddenly just, you know, transforms it into flat space. So, but it has been done and it has been done very successfully. And it just so happens that we manage the two that I found, so. And that is, that is all of these slides that I have. I know it's kind of a lot. Um, like I said, it's inside the mind of Mike, it's like that. The other thing, again, I will mention is, and, and they, they, these have been brought up before, is connectivity. Um, connectivity to our existing hotels that we have to downtown, to restaurants, everything like that. Uh, Thomas mentioned the footprint around our building, um, the, the challenge that we have for restaurants and, and, and other hotels besides the Sheraton, um, and those type of things. Um, the airport got brought up as well. Um, you know, and I had a chance, I flew to Chicago on Sunday night, and then, or Sunday and then Monday back. There, there are some challenges. It, it is a nice little airport. I would personally love to see some more options in there. But that's for another discussion. But questions, I'm ready. I think I am. Do you happen to know any of the cost of renovating these, uh, kind of these 
systems that drop down from the ceiling get it's 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 expensive. I, I don't. It was in the CSL study. I want to say it was like close to five million dollars for Long Beach. No, no, for ours. Oh, for ours. ours. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I know Long Beach with their with their system. They spent. I think the, all the revenue. If you go and look at that CSL study, I think it was all in five million dollars to renovate. Yeah. With just that, with that grid, and there's a few other things, and there's some amenities that they would add to. So, did that include ensuring that the structure would kind of support the big grid system? Um, I'm not sure if there's structural had been done on that at all. So, okay. so that might be a direct parallel that that exact work could be done, but uh, we would still need to make sure that the structure itself would stand the weight of the rigging grid, everything on it. Mm -hmm. Great information, Mike. I, I appreciate it. Um, can we talk a little bit about the Premier Center itself and going back to some of your early observations of some of the events you've seen? If, if we could go back in time and maybe do things, tweak things a little bit different on that facility from a customer experience perspective, which does need to be part of the scope of our conversation a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the what tweaks would you make in the perfect world? Well, in a perfect in a perfect world. <laughs> Um, you know, certainly, you know, parking, parking, that the whole thing that comes up with, um, and certainly with a lot of other um, facilities, whether it's Canary Stadium or the football field uh, in the convention center, um, if we have multiple events going on at the same time, you know, parking is, is a challenge, um, there's no doubt. Um, that, you know, that's why I mentioned, you know, a parking garage and, and a hotel type thing. Um, I look at the campus out, outside the campus right now. I don't see a lot of other potential growth opportunities where we could say if there was if there was a an area where we said okay yes we could go ahead and and, and raise that and create another you know 500 parking spaces whatever. I, I don't see that um, here in its current thing. That's why I, my suggestion would if you go up then you you can p potentially get there. The the one challenge I do see with the Premier Center is the, the main entrance. Um, you know, we do 85% of our ingress through that one, through that one um, entrance. Um, but I, as I tell my staff, I said, you know, you guys did it right. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is a fantastic building from top to bottom. It is, it, you know, has a tremendous amount of steel, connectivity, AV stuff, um, just amenities. I said, again, and I've been to a lot of different arenas around the country, and, I, and I'm, I've been in this business so long, when I go to another place, I don't honestly enjoy myself because I'm looking at their stuff. I'm looking at their stuff. And I just, I mean, you know, I worked at Disney. So if I go to a theme park, I'm looking at the thing. That guy's chewing gum. His, his shirt's untucked. I mean, I, that's what I do. And it's, it's, I guess, kind of sad, but it, it's, what, it's, it's what it is. And so that when I look at that and I communicate to my staff, I say, hey, be lucky that you're in a building like this because they did it right. You know, oh, the, the one thing, and I, and I mentioned some of my staff, I said, you know, when the Premier Center was thinking about being constructed, there was, there was pros and cons both ways. But now if you look at it and say, can we imagine Sioux Falls without the Premier Center? I don't think many of us can. And to me, that was, that was a big step, you know. But the, the journey is not just one step. It's, it's, it's step number two and step number three to get to complete our journey. And to me, that's some of the stuff that I, I just presented. Because again, I, it, the city has progressive thinking. You know, if, if, if they didn't, there wouldn't be a task force right now. There wouldn't be all these, these great people that are committed <laughs> to potentially putting their input to, to, to make Sioux Falls better. I mean, and that was one of the things when I came from Texas, I was like, I was excited about it because one, it's a busy building, not just the Premier Center, but all the other aspects of it. It's up and coming. It had a roof too compared to a stadium, so that was a plus. But it, it's, 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 that, it's that you're on the edge. You're on the edge. And, it's, and again, it's, it's not easy to make those commitments and to make those recommendations to, to take that next step. But if we rewound, we rewound, you know, nine, ten years ago, and people were thinking about the Premier Center, and now if we if we weren't here in this thing like that, I mean, what would Sioux Falls be without it? How many big acts do we get? I mean, we're 
third high, best ranked building in the Midwest based on a number of shows and everything like that. And again, that's support from the community for buying the tickets. Jim can put the best shows in here, the best acts in here, but if the community doesn't buy tickets and buy into that effect, then you know what, the shows aren't gonna come. They're not gonna come back. So that's testament to the community. That's also commit, it's testament to the facility that we have that the shows do like to come back. But again, in my opinion, it, the time is right for that next step for whatever it is. I mean, I would love to host NCAA first and second round again, because I've hosted that before you know, a first four, something along those lines, to really elevate it. And like I said, it's hard to put a dollar amount on what the, what the impact is when you get, when you, get you, you know, your, your CVB message out there on national TV like that. I know every time I saw it or the markets that I was in, God, it made me feel proud. It made me feel proud. So, I digress. In, in respect for everybody's time, I think we're going to thank Mike for his time. Warn you that we're going to need to tap into your expertise uh, a bunch more before this group is done. You know where I'm at. Thank you. <laughs> and turn over the floor to Ms. Smith. Okay, thank you. I did not bring anything to put up on the slides because I pretty much knew that the two gentlemen before me um, we're going to put up all kinds of things that probably covered everything. I'm going to take it from a little bit different um, stance. Maybe go back just a little bit uh, in time since I've been around for a few years and have been, I think, uh, in one way or another on um, almost every committee or task force that, that, um, that has existed uh, in the past 35 years as we've studied this building, these buildings. The convention center, I gotta tell you, way back before we ever even talked about a convention center, uh, what jarred us as a community was that SDEA, South Dakota Education Association, had forever rotated between Sioux Falls and Rapid City. It was just a given. Well, one year, it was our turn, and there were rumblings that Brookings had the audacity to offer SDEA $500 to move out of Sioux Falls and come to Brookings. And we were shook. So, um, we, I mean, actually they did do it, by the way. And we said, we've got to do something to shake this town up. We've got to do something to make us stand out and we've got to get moving on a facility that throws us uh, into the forefront. And that's when we really started talking about this Brookings SDEA story uh, to get Sioux Falls going and thinking. Well, you know, I look now today as to where this community is, how far uh, Sioux Falls has come, you know, we're on the edge. Mike is right. We're on the edge again. And while we have these wonderful facilities here that we're, we all enjoy as part of our quality of life, um, and they are wonderful. Please don't think that I'm thinking they're not. They're wonderful. Every day we sit in our offices and pound and say, oh my gosh, we have got to get more space. We're falling behind. We're falling behind. Um, just a few examples. Um, and these are just some of the communities that we compete against for conventions, meetings, and events. Minneapolis has a million six square feet of convention space. You think we don't compete against them? We do. Milwaukee, 667,475 square feet. Toledo, 375,000. Omaha, Omaha, we're in, I mean, we're battling with them all the time. Right now, 200 and, sorry, I want to make sure I got, 346,000 square feet. Um, Des Moines, I'm looking at two, Des Moines, 286,000 square feet. Oklahoma City, 275,000, new convention center. Milwaukee, 265,800. 
St. Paul, 250. Madison, Wisconsin, 250. Uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, 234. Uh, Rochester, Minnesota, 200. Tulsa, 194.6. Sioux Falls, 132,000, if we include all three buildings. Okay? Now, while I tell you that, I can tell you that as we sit here today, Madison, Wisconsin is getting ready to add another 50,000 square feet and a 30,000 square foot ballroom to their building. Uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, who we are starting to see uh, make a little more noise all the time, um, is determining and, and probably moving forward with a convention center of approximately 150,000 square feet. And then it says, a 150,000 square foot convention center would be larger than those in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Lexington, Kentucky, and Lansing, Michigan, three of the peer cities mentioned in their market assessment. I mean, we're being watched. Um, but then it says it's smaller than Madison, Wisconsin, Des Moines, and Raleigh, North Carolina, et cetera. Um, I've got a whole pile of, of cities who are, are adding on. My point is we have a beautiful facility. While all these communities are adding on and have been adding on, we have not been. I have a list with me today um, and Mike just talked about 35 more groups that um, want more space. Um, yeah, and I mean, clear back, <coughs> the first convention that we booked in, in this facility um, was shortly after it opened, the Lutheran Women's Missionary League, 3,500 women will not come back here because there still is nothing to walk to. And there still is not more space. And we try to sell the arena, and we try to sell the event center as more space. And I, I, I'm gonna be honest as to what kind of feedback we get from meeting planners. And these are quotes. No, we don't want arenas, we want convention centers. We want more meeting space. We don't want an arena for more convention space, unless they need more trade show space. So don't confuse that part. When you're talking to a true meeting planner, they're not kidding. They want meeting rooms like these that we're sitting in. Um, I am not, in our business, we don't sit here and, and, or at any place and tell you the name and, and planner of every group. But right here is all the detail on all the groups that have told us no and all the whys of no space, no dates available, et cetera, for Sioux Falls in the recent past. Um, you asked about airlines, um, airfare transportation, it's a problem. Uh, cost, because they can fly into Omaha for much less and be in a bigger facility with walkability. Um, they can do the same in Minneapolis. They can do the same in Kansas City and many other locations. Cost, and sometimes they have to make two stops. Don't like that. Um, we don't have enough hotel rooms attached. For years, I remember calling the former mayor from Washington, D.C., where we were doing a sales blitz several years ago, saying, Mayor, it's all we're hearing out here. We've got to have 400 hotel rooms attached. We have a great Sheraton Hotel attached. It's just not enough rooms. I asked my sales staff, honestly, truly, you guys, from day to day to day to day, fighting to get more business in here, how many more hotel rooms do we need? 400 total? And they said, the best point of all, Terry, are we building for today or are we building for the future? If we're building for today, then let's get a total of 400. But if we're building for the future, we better have another 400. On-site attached.
and it better be a hotel that is full service and it better be a four star plus. Look at our competition. I challenge everybody on this group. I know we all travel. I said this to, to uh, TJ one day. We all travel, but you know, I, when I travel, I look at all this stuff because like Mike, that's in our brain. But when, we, when some of you travel, you're not looking at all the gory details that we are about buildings and, and connectivity and all that. But I challenge you from now on out for a while, look at that stuff when you're traveling. How, how close is it? How easy is it? How many hotel rooms are attached? Do you have to travel a ways? Why do we all clamor to get into the headquarter hotel when we go to a convention? Why? Because it's attached. We want to make it easy. If we don't want to leave that convention center during that convention, we don't want to. But then, hey, if we're in the headquarter hotel and we want to leave, fine. But that's our choice. And headquarter hotels, I mean, just talk to them about being the spot for um, conventions because people don't want to leave unless they want to. We all are, we have to think as positioning to Sioux Falls to be the most competitive. What can we do to be most competitive? What do we do for the future? We are not making this decision for today or tomorrow. It's for five years and 10 years out. And that means thinking a little bit bigger. We need this meeting space doubled. If we're really gonna think about out. If we're gonna think about the next couple years, then fine, add a few feet. But we're already behind. So as a community, do, want, do we wanna to continue to be behind? Or do we wanna be progressive like we are in about everything else uh, every other element of this community and do we want to get it together here and add on to this facility and make it what it should be what Sioux Falls is known for people want to come here they love it here but we have to provide the facility to make it what it is um, when this building was built the first time we did the campaign we got beat up the second time we went back around what we learned was we had to make a guarantee to the community that building this building was doing the right thing for the community. It wasn't built just to make um, Dan's business better or Eric's business better. It was built for the betterment of driving business in an increasing level throughout the community to drive economic benefit to the community, not to any one hotel, not to any one business or anything. We are, we are falling behind in, in maintaining that commitment by not increasing the amount of, of room space out here that we can sell. We have guests who would love to come here and share the quality of life that we enjoy every day. But from an economic standpoint, I can tell you that last year, visitors spent over $249 million in Sioux Falls. And that number is only a number that the CVB can verify, that we can actually count. Our International Association says then multiply that most likely by three to get the real number. So some of you have heard me say, if we stopped every visitor from 50 miles out from coming to Sioux Falls, no convention meeting or event could be held in this community and nobody could come into this town from 50 miles out for three consecutive months, what would it do to our economy? They couldn't come to concerts, conventions, meetings, shop, medical, anything. And we're sitting here making a decision about that very thing for the future. Conventions, meetings, and events create economic benefit. They don't just come to this building, come in and leave. They're at least gonna grab a burger. 
And most likely, if we have the right walkability, entertainment, shops, transportation to and from, things to do, marketing, letting them know, what are they going to do? They're going to probably stay longer. They're going to plan that trip. It might be a two-day trip this time, but hey, they find out that Carrie Underwood's coming in whatever, October. Oh my gosh, we've got to come back for that. Or the Summer is going to be here in February. We've got to come back for that. That's all part of the bigger picture that we have to make happen for this, for this building. And I realize we can't build, we can't do these expansions for, you know, Easter Sunday, as they always say. But we have the numbers, we have the supportive information. I really feel strongly that can support us going forward in making an investment in the future of this community to do these expansions. I swear, I swear, Laura, this area is going to build up someday, like I told you 100 years ago. Uh, but, but really, I think it is. We've got 5,200 and nine hotel rooms in this town today. About, um, I'd say 4,200 of them are committable. But when it comes to booking what Thomas was talking about and, and to kind of what Mike and, and Stu and the crew out here are talking about, you know, we need some, we don't want to just go crazy building hotel rooms because that, that just divides the pie up and you've got a mess on your hands. We've got the restaurants in town. My gosh, we've got, We've got over 900 rest, excuse me, 700 restaurants, but true restaurants, you're over about 600-ish. We've got the restaurants. Are they in the right location? Might need to be determined. We need hotels with the right kind of space. We've got to get more attached here. Um, I just want to... I could go on. I have no real thoughts about all this, as you can tell. But just um, there was an article that just came out that really struck me, and I'll just leave you with these thoughts. The author posed this. His the, actually the article was what a convention center adds to a city, and it came out in Successful Meetings magazine, which is a national magazine, um, obviously in the industry. Number one. Is the center essentially full and turning away impactful business? Well, we don't have enough space, and a lot of times the space is full. If we have additional space, our visitor industry lunch, and by the way, you should all have a ticket too. Just a little free promo there. Um, coming up May 11th, we're going to use the, the, all the exhibit halls in the ballroom. What if a convention would come along, can't book it because we're having a luncheon? If there was more space, we could have a convention in here and a luncheon so that Mike doesn't kick us out for having just the luncheon. Let's raise the rent. <laughs> raise the rent, okay. Um, number, <laughs> uh, number two, is the destination attractive to meeting attendees? Is Sioux Falls attractive? Is there a hotel package available to support the expansion. Most convention centers are already short on walkable convention blocks of hotel rooms. Convention centers working with hotels to collect rebates to help cover convention center costs. If you upgrade your facility and hotel package, will existing and future business be able to afford the increased hotel and other rates. Does the marketplace want it? Does Sioux Falls want this increase? Is the economy or certain parts of the economy growing in the region? There are three types of space in, con in today's convention centers. Exhibit halls, ballrooms, and meeting rooms. A current trend is a desire for more ballrooms and meeting rooms than in the past. Today, exhibit space is often the last to be expanded or an offering less important than others. Ballrooms, if designed properly and divisible, can essentially serve any role. 
from trade show floor or concert hall to major dinner function or a series of smaller meeting rooms. More authentic and unique types of space to meet and work in um, and be multi-purpose are um, what people are looking for. First Class Convention Center has helped a destination improve the visitor industry as a whole. Uh, <clears throat> times have changed and the power of great design, walkability, and a well-conceived facility are what matter. Um, there have been times when um, this gentleman has recommended that clients expand convention centers and others when he has advised against it. St. Charles, Missouri, who we have watched over the years, a suburb of St. Louis, he realized the convention center was bursting at the seams and he recommended doubling its size along with building a second convention hotel. Today it is bustling convention hub. And he ends with, if you're not moving forward, you're going backwards because of the investments our, co our competitors are making. I could go on for a long time with a lot more information, but I think that's probably enough. Thank you, Terry. I know we're starting to run out of time, but there'll yeah. be a couple of questions. Go ahead. Um, you had mentioned a number, and then you said to take it times three. Yes. But I didn't catch the number. What was that number? Uh, it, it was an economic impact yeah. number of okay. two, about $249 million. Okay. Thank you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Mike, you showed us a slide that showed convention center, arena, baseball stadium, and losses to each of those facilities and far greater losses to the second two than the first one. Uh, is there a sense of how the economics of the convention center space change if the arena was converted into additional flat floor space? Yeah, based on the arena usage now and, and, and obviously the datedness of the equipment and the, you know just the infrastructure over there to convert that to convert that into more usable space, flat floor spaces. I mean, obviously, that's a need. Um, to, to me, I think it, it becomes it becomes a profitable situation. Uh, but obviously, at some point, you got to put money into it. Obviously, so at some point, you're gonna, you know, but you're at least you're making it back. Right now, we're putting some money into it, but we're not necessarily seeing that return. You know, it's it's a, a boss of mine always said, you know, good money after bad, um, and that's that's the way I view it a little bit. Two quick questions. One, uh, kind of on that point, looking at the CSL report, it looks like the improvements uh, proposed by CSL was 2.4 on the low end, 5.2 on the high end for the arena improvements, which include the rating and various improvements. Um, and they did a study that um, said that they would generate revenue, an additional revenue, of about 2.38. Now, your idea might change that a little bit if there were two floors, but presuming that they kind of took that into account about what was available and what was not. Um, might it get difficult if we're talking about a $10 million or $15 million improvement by changing the structure and all of that? Your idea sounded really expensive, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, about the two floor option and things like that. I'm just saying maybe one floor with the CSL, does that, does that make some sense too? Well, again, it's, it's like it's it's like Terry mentioned. Are we are we are we looking at it in the short term? You know, and if yes, we I think with one floor, yes, we could get by in the short term. But then, are we looking five or seven years down the road, going where are we going to get that additional space? To me, if you're going to make do the project, you you, you go ahead and, and, for lack of a better term, do it right and, and maximize your space that you can build towards the future as opposed to just building for right now because like like Terry said if you're not looking outwards you're you're going to fall behind yeah. and that's not even comparing to other markets and everything like that it's it's it, again we we have a small amount of space where we can expand um you know the my mind the football stadium's not going away anytime soon um so you know we're not going to knock down the hotel and, and build out that way so we have that space that due to the infrastructure and the datedness of it, to me that's the most likely thing. And you might as well maximize the height of the, of the ceiling 
and try to get as much out of there as you can and be able to rent it to get a return. Thank you. Um, Terry, one last question. You, you kind of mentioned casually that you think that the uh, event center uh, campus area is eventually going to blow up or something. I, that's the wrong word, but something. It's going to take off uh, in a way that it hasn't for the last 65 years. I keep hoping for that, yes. Yeah. There's a couple things that I think are missing, and that is uh, the density of rooftops and the density of jobs, of corporate jobs, that make this viable 365 days a year for a lot of those industries, yes. for a lot of those amenities. Agreed. Which is why almost all of these happen in downtowns. So why? What? What do you think? What's going to help? I, I agree with you. By the way, your your story about more hotel rooms is compelling. But what makes you think it's going to take off otherwise for the whole walk village? Sheer hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, j honestly, just just hope. When I look at other communities and how they have built up around their convention centers, but. To be very, 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 very honest, I know it's going to be tough because of what you just said. I, I just hope that at some point somebody will come along and put a little strip mall or something that has a coffee <coughs> shop and a, you know, a little gift shop or something where people can walk to to grab that little gift to take home to the grandkids or, or you know, grab a piece of candy if that's what they want or something uh, it hurts us it hurts us bad yeah, thank you. so it's it's sheer hope I have nothing to base it on other than I'm determined it will happen somehow so I want to follow up on that I don't think that we'll be able to solve it today but maybe in one of the committees we can put together a methodology of what that success looks like and then put steps to get us from here to there would you be part of that committee, whoever is going to be on that committee? Of course, yeah. whatever, yeah. Just to find success that way? We will figure it out today. You know, maybe that's part of hotel development. <coughs> I, I don't know, I don't know, you know, I don't know. And I think it, you're right, those are big questions that are going to, are probably beyond the scope a little bit of what we're talking about when we need to focus on the physical amenities to these facilities that we're, we're talking about, but certainly it needs to be done within the mindset of the long-term economic health yeah. of the campus. So, yeah. uh, like Mike, we're going to need more of your expertise as we continue down this road, and appreciate your time. Can I add one Please. more thing? And you know that I didn't touch on the transportation thing, but that is, that's a critical piece. And that's going to take a lot of work too to figure that puzzle out on how, when, and who. Well, one really quick question: Mike's kind of site plan showed a couple of hotels away from the <coughs> convention center. You talked a lot about uh, adjacency and connectivity. Do they need to be able to walk physically indoors from the hotel to the convention center, or can it be nearby? Or it's got to that? be connected. If it's a walkway fine but it's got to be connected yeah it's to, to terry's point too i mean i think we most of us have been to las vegas um kind of what what they what las vegas is doing over on the on the strip um as opposed to their traffic things they have the escalators that you go over mm -hmm. the traffic something like that obviously in some sort of tunnel so that when we don't ask people when it's 30 below to to walk it in but some sort of like that connectivity or sky bridge or something like that would be a cool type thing. I mean, I'm looking forward to going to Minneapolis during the winter and kind of seeing their, their type of thing that I've heard so much about. We don't have that in Texas, so it's ours are air conditioned. One follow-up question, because I, I think the study mentioned one of the options is, okay, if you knock down the arena and you just add it on brand new, I think that had a price tag of like some version of 60 million, which I think we all agree that probably isn't going to pencil. But um, if you, did like a, say you had a flat floor space and then you had the ballroom up top. Does, and do you still end up having a rig, the need for a rigging system similar to what you showed with Long Beach? Or does that totally, would that totally change the dynamic of to that? Me, to me, it totally changes the dynamic. And again, I, I believe Long Beach did that because they, again, they, they had, you know, over 500,000 square feet of convention space. And obviously, Southern California has a lot of different places that they can go. But they felt it was a better use of the arena to create a unique space that they could that it was multi-purpose. But they just weren't, you know, 
you know, knocking it down, basically. So. And don't forget, while we're talking about this flat floor space and this additional ballroom, if we don't add more breakout rooms like this one, we might as well not do anything. Because if you add more flat floor space for bigger groups, I mean, right now we could sell 20 at a time if we had them for the larger groups. We've got an RMP right now that wants 44. I'm like, can't do that. Well, one of the things too, we, we get we got hit with this just this last couple of days is the the need for uh, gender neutral restrooms yep. and also uh, nursing mothers areas. And we get that all the time and my staff is constantly like that. Now it's not really feasible in our current situation to go ahead and build those out. But if we did do something in the arena, that would be a perfect place to, to check the boxes on those things to take care of those amenities, which more and more people are requesting. Um, and really that's easy. going to be a norm it, it will be it, it probably will be. is already so i i would say that we have enough expertise on this committee to not throw any ideas out so i really think we need to do if we have a couple of techs and a pricing person here and really do a thorough job for the community of researching all options so i really like not having to do another enclosure for me of, of keeping the existing arena that might not be the best option long term. So it's something that we really should really do our homework on. I don't want to throw it out just because someone out of town said it might be expensive. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> This has been a great conversation, and I know we could keep going, but to be sensitive to your time, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, again, there'll be more communication coming on the subcommittees uh, and the activities we're hoping to get out of those committees before our next meeting is going to be important. So you're not going to see a several week lull here. It's going to be need to be active between now and the next time we all get together again. Uh, to all our speakers, again, appreciate your time, information, uh, and continued support as we continue down this road.